ambassadors, distinguished guests, dear friends. First, I would like to thank Ambassador Michael Antel and his team for hosting this event and for inviting Arctic Frontiers to collaborate on it. As you mentioned, it, uh, the, the, both the participation and the program looks really, really good. So I'm looking forward to this day. Norway and Finland are both strong Arctic countries. Finland is at the forefront of smart technology uh, innovation, while Norway leads the way for a sustainable global ocean economy. How can Finland and Norway work together to develop new technology solutions for a smart Arctic? Uh, Arctic Frontiers has a long-standing relationship uh, with Finland and actors in Finland. Uh, we have, among others, Business Aula, which we've had a good partnership with since 2014. The embassy here, of course. Um, the Arctic Frontiers title in 2018, Connecting the Arctic, was uh, inspired by the Finnish strategy for the Arctic Council and the Arctic uh, e Economic Council. And Finland has also been a very important contributor to our plenary programs with high level representation for the last years. We are looking very much forward to welcome Minister of the Environment, Energy and Housing, Kimmo Tilkainen, to Arctic Frontiers 2019 in January. Arctic Frontiers is, a, is connecting across borders and across sectors. It is built on a vital partnership of some 40 partners, universities, research institutes, business organizations, NGOs, businesses and governments on different levels. We like to call it the National Arctic Team, but with a growing international congregation. We work closely with our partners on strategy, development and on content. Arctic Frontiers is the largest arena for discussing sustainable development in the Arctic, with some 3,000 delegates participating at Arctic Frontiers in Tromsø each January. Arctic Frontiers is the agenda setter in and for the Arctic. In addition to our main conference, we are organizing a number of events in and outside of uh, Norway. We have had three seminars in Helsinki uh, in collaboration with the Norwegian Embassy there since 2014. Um, and generally, we are aiming to set the agenda for a sustainable, balanced and knowledge-based development of uh, the Arctic. We do this by focusing our year-round work on four main topics knowledge, ocean, societies, and sustainable business development. The title for Arctic Frontiers 2019 is Smart Arctic, as uh, was mentioned. We will be discussing smart societies, smart ocean technology, smart communication, and smart uh, business. But also, as the ambassador mentioned, very important, the snow how that our two countries have in common and, and solutions for other parts of the world and how to, to better be connected in the circumpolar uh, area. And I believe it's both in Norwegian and Finnish interest to alter the picture uh, of the Arctic as an ice desert, a museum, and a region in special need of protection. So the title, in addition to, to pointing towards smart uh, Arctic knowledge societies, SMART is also an attempt to correct the general image of the Arctic from museum to progressive, connected, smart part of the world with thriving and progressive communities. The main topics for the 2019 plenary conference where seven Norwegian ministers are confirmed in, in, confirmed in addition to the, the Finnish minister are Arctic in a geopolitical context, the power of knowledge, smart and resilient societies, and a full day focusing on uh, the ocean. The SDGs, ocean high level panel, ocean science, seafood, shipping, energy, mineral resources, and ocean technology. I would also like to mention our major uh, uh, business side events and a business to business meeting in collaboration with Arc Trade. Now, we will move on to today's first panel with the State Secretary Matti Antonen and State Secretary Aydan Halvorsen. Uh, they will give their introduction successively and we will then have a panel discussion with the Q&A, as uh, Hanna uh, mentioned uh, uh, earlier. On that note, it is my pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, State Secretary Matti Antonen. Please, the floor is yours.
Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the organizers of uh, organizing such a popular and uh, timely, timely event. I'm representing here another uh, uh, Arctic country, Finland. Sometimes, uh, when, when living in the in the present climate, uh, you don't feel so Arctic. But uh, actually, Finland is still the only country in the world where all the ports freeze every single year. Uh, I think that's a very important starting point when thinking about Finland and Arctic. At the moment, I'm also representing country which is. Uh, the chair country of the Arctic uh, Council. The Arctic Council has its roots in the first ever environmental ministerial meeting of the region, which was held in uh, 1991 in Rovaniemi. Then in 1996, this was made into an organization which we now know as Arctic Council. Environmental protection stands in the in the center of that, of the policies and the actions of the Arctic Council, but there are also other themes which have become even you cannot say even more important, but which have become also important in this uh, context. On side of the environment, we have three major themes during our presidency of the organization. Connectivity, meteorology and education. A short explanation why these themes were chosen on top of the environment. When economic and other activity increases in the Arctic regions, we need better communication technologies and solutions. That part of the world is not yet covered by the cell phone networks. We are so used to this in our daily life that we don't understand that the Arctic is basically, basically out of those networks. The big question is how do these ships, these people who are working there, uh, how are they going to be connected in an economical and efficient way? And also the communities and uh, small villages and cities which are located in the region, they are usually very far from each other. We are not going to have uh, cables drawn between those places. So this is a real question. Increased shipping and other activity also calls for better understanding the weather conditions. Winds, how cold it is going to be, what kind of ice conditions will there be? And we have also to understand how climate change really affects the region. So we need more work on the meteorology side as well. And the third one, education. We can easily understand here when we live in Oslo and Helsinki that you can get the kids to school and they can get first rate education, you know, with using rather traditional methods. But when those kids are living hundreds and hundreds of kilometers apart, how can you provide them with modern skills and, and, and knowledge. And I think there we need the modern education technologies to make those kids as competitive as the kids are here in Oslo or in Helsinki. I think that's, a, that's their right as a citizens or our societies. The climate change is making Arctic regions more accessible. There are major gas and oil projects going on. Uh, and there is also a need for uh, transporting these goods to the market. Northeast Passage was opened by a Finn who then moved to Sweden called Nordenskjöld. At that time, it was a really tough journey. Now we see modern tankers going back and forth from the Yamal Peninsula to markets both in East and West. 
shipping in the Northeast Passage is going to grow dramatically in the coming years. What has this to do with Finland? Uh, the whole concept of double acting ship, you know, those ships which are transporting this gas was developed in Helsinki. Uh, much of that technology is still manufactured in Finland because that requires these propeller systems which are going around 360 degrees. So those big tankers which are transporting this gas from Yamal, they can go in ice one and a half, two meters thick because they are icebreakers when they go backwards. And that whole uh, transportation solution was developed in Finland as well. As I said, the only country in the world where every single port is icebound every single year. Uh, we talk about climate change and uh, being carbon neutral. Finland was carbon neutral last time in early 50s. So our time of having net emissions of carbon dioxide is rather short. A little over 60 years we have been not carbon neutral. And we are going back there as soon as we can. Already now, more than 40% of our energy comes from renewable sources. We are going upwards. Uh, difficult to say when we reach this carbon neutrality, but we are on, on the way there. Having big carbon sinks in our forests, in our nature, and then reducing massively carbon dioxide emissions. Want to be one of those first countries, first developed countries in the world to reach that goal. Good competition with our neighbors here in the north, Norway and Sweden. Uh, a, special, a specific question connected to climate in these regions is uh, black carbon. We all people who live in the north understand that when you have black particles, on white snow, that white snow and ice melts much faster. Uh, that's the reason Finland has taken black carbon and, and reducing the emissions of black carbon from, from uh, energy production, from shipping, from flaring, as its main, one of the main uh, ideas behind the uh, idea of an uh, Arctic uh, summit. That gives quite a quick fix to this uh, local climate uh, changing uh, uh, phenomenon. Because when you can get that black stuff from the ice, from the snow, that snow reflects the sun and not uh, kind of absorbs it. And, and therefore, I think this is something we can do. It's a much quicker way of changing things than trying to reduce carbon dioxide or methane emissions. Uh, our idea of an uh, Arctic summit has been floated some time ago and we hope that uh, the Arctic 8, those countries in the region, will really come to Helsinki and uh, show the leadership in these environmental and other questions. I think it's an important thing and it's also an important signal to the world that the Arctic country Arctic countries themselves take care of this region. From my side, a big thank to the organizers and I hope we will have a very interesting and good seminar today. Thank you. State Secretary Matti Attunen, um, you will be invited back up uh, afterwards. Uh, now I'd like to give the floor to State Secretary Aydin Halvorsen. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Ulla, and good morning, Excellencies, ladies and, and gentlemen. I am very happy to be here uh, with so many friends, so many key stakeholders in the future development in the Arctic. And uh, thank you to uh, the Embassy, to uh, Arctic Frontiers, for inviting me to discuss some of Norway's uh, Arctic policies uh, as they are being implemented and being developed uh, also now under the Finnish chairmanship of the Arctic Council. And before I start, I would like to acknowledge uh, the Embassy of Finland, uh, Ambassador Rantel, uh, and also Arctic Frontiers in organizing this seminar. And I, would, I really appreciate your recognition also in engaging of uh, the importance of engaging the business community uh, in, in this matter. 
So let me start by saying a few words on Norway's ambition, ambitions in the high north and in the Arctic. And of course, this is a region of high strategic importance to Norway. Uh, ever since the Bonnevik II government with the Foreign Minister Jan Petersen launched our first white paper uh, on the high north uh, to parliament in 2005, this issue has figured uh, at, the very, uh, at the very top of our political agenda uh, through various governments. And Prime Minister Solberg launched the government's new Arctic strategy last year. The strategy outlines our ambition to make the northern part of Norway one of our most uh, innovative, creative and sustainable regions. And we have five priority areas for realizing that ambition. International cooperation, business development, knowledge development, infrastructure, environmental protection and emergency preparedness. And it's also a key uh, point in the strategy to, make, to create a more holistic approach, seeing the national domestic policies and the international issues and developments uh, more jointly uh, and sort of bringing them together uh, better than we have done before. In the second half of 2020, we will launch a new white paper to Parliament on the High North, both to, both to report on the progress uh, ha that has been made uh, in the strategy work up to now and also to outline the way forward. And I think maintaining the momentum in developing our Arctic policies is important. And uh, to, to stick with the uh, Ulis term, we'll, we'll try to keep it smart, so to say. So let me turn now to some of the preconditions for a sustainable economic development in the Arctic. And I would start by, mod by men say, mentioning modern infrastructure, which is essential if we are to remain internationally competitive, competitive and for the in innovative businesses of the North to continue to grow. Matti spoke about connectivity, and I think improving the broadband coverage in the Arctic is one issue of crucial important, importance, not only to people and businesses, but also to research, logistics, fisheries, search and rescue, and also uh, on security and defense. Quicker, stable broadband will contribute to sustainable economic growth in the Arctic overall. That is why the Norwegian government is proposing a conditional pledge to the company Space Norway uh, of more than 100 million euros, uh, 1 billion Norwegian kroner, in equity capital to realize this project. And the first satellite launches are planned uh, already for 2022. More traditional connectivity issues are uh, also important. Fisheries, aquaculture depend on efficient transport connections in order to communicate and ship their valuable goods to international markets. And the same is, of course, true for very numerous other businesses. And this is a major driver for uh, the more than 4 billion euros transport investment project in Nordland, Troms and Finnmark, planned for and allocated in a national transport plan for the next decade. And together with Finland, Russia and Sweden, we are now revising the joint transport plan for the Barents region. The railway sector is being discussed. We are awaiting the Stefanis report on the project analyzing a possible connection between Kirkenes and Rovaniemi, as well as other possible new railway connections in the Arctic. Of course, this is an ambitious idea, which has generated a lot of interest. Knowledge is an essential component for developing the Arctic. Science and research will be key in creating solutions for the region in the future and for promoting sustainable development. Norway has a wide range of research and education institutions in the north, including two universities in Tromsø and Bodø. The higher education institutions in northern Norway cater to more than 28,000 students, 20 different locations in the north, and the number of uh, doctorates doubled last year as one example of the uh, developments in, in competence building in the region. These are positive developments, but if we are to succeed in making North Norway one of our most innovative and creative regions, knowledge and science must continue to be at the very core of our efforts. I would also mention stability as another prerequisite for sustainable growth for peaceful development. We must continue to work to ensure that the Arctic remains a peaceful, stable region where predictability, cooperation and respect for international law prevails. And I would say we have succeeded uh, well at that so far, even in the more challenging security environment uh, of our day. For this, we also need a strong Arctic Council. We need constructive international cooperation to continue. 
in the Arctic Council, but also in the other regional institutions and formats, like the Barents Euro Arctic Council and the Northern Dimension. A constructive working relationship with our neighbor Russia is crucial for the stability in the North and works to our mutual benefit. Uh, our relationship, of course, stretches back through the decades with roots going back centuries, and it serves us well. So we are pursuing continued pragmatic, pragmatic practical bilateral cooperation on issues of common interest. These are uh, areas such as uh, fisheries management, environmental protection, nuclear safety and maritime safety, including search and rescue at sea, and maintaining very important people-to-people -people, uh, contacts. And today, as one example, we have the world's most abundant, and I uh, claim, uh, I think correctly, the world's best managed fish, fish stocks uh, in the Barents Sea, uh, under the joint Russian-Norwegian management. Joint total value of 20 billion Norwegian kroner uh, this year. Uh, huge, hugely important. So we must maintain our tradition of cooperation in the Arctic. And to conclude, I would also like to say a few words uh, more specifically about the Arctic Council uh, and its role, uh, its key role in the future development of the region. And of course, the Council has proven instrumental in finding common solutions to regional challenges. And one of the reasons for that is that it gathers the states, it gathers the key stakeholders, and also the indigenous uh, peoples. So a robust, uh, well-functioning Arctic Council is a major contribution to continued stability and development uh, in the Arctic. The Council is currently working on its uh, new strategic plan to guide its work. And this will be the first ever strategic overall plan uh, developed by the Council. Another important development will be how the Council answers the instructions from the last ministerial meeting uh, in Fairbanks to further develop Arctic uh, marine cooperation, which is also, of course, a key issue. And we are certain that the Council, under its current Finnish uh, leadership, will deliver ambitious and forward-looking solutions in both these areas. Another very positive development under the Finnish uh, chairmanship is the improved cooperation with the Arctic Economic Council. And the establishment, of course, of the AEC uh, a few years back was a breakthrough and uh, a reflection uh, on the fact that industry wants to play a leading role in the development of the Arctic, and it needs to play a leading role. And engaging all the key stakeholders uh, in the uh, private sector is, of course, necessary to succeed. Important step to develop the related council and the AAC, and we strongly support this uh, development. Uh, I would also say uh, another issue where Finland has shown uh, leadership is in engaging the observers uh, in the Arctic Council. Uh, and of course, the fact that a lot of the developments in uh, the Arctic have now global uh, consequences, global repercussions, means that also the observers need to be engaged uh, more broadly than we have seen before. And we welcome a stronger uh, cooperation with the observers, of course, respecting that there will also always be some formal limitations for observers compared to members. So to sum up, let me say that we are uh, very impressed with the Finnish chairmanship of the Arctic Council so far. Uh, and we, are, uh, we will use that as an inspiration for planning our next uh, chairmanship, which is uh, in 2023. So looking forward to the discussion and the input of uh, this esteemed audience. Thank you. Fleet's uh, State Secretary Matti Anton return to the podium. Thank you very much to uh, both of you. <clears throat> and I would also like to, to start with a few questions uh, myself before we open the floor uh, for, for questions. Um, at uh, Arctic Frontiers 2017, Prime Minister Solberg and Sipilia met with business delegations to discuss possible Norwegian Finnish business projects. And I remember they agreed on, on common cross-sector thinking, meaning digitalization and new technologies and more traditional industries, uh, such as fisheries. Um, working together on the UN's sustainable, uh, sustainable development goals and meeting more often. There seems to be a big potential for closer collaboration, even though the collaboration is good in, in the business sector. 
Maybe you could share some of your plans ahead for the bilateral dialogue on these issues. Well, well the, the, a few words to, to start off. I would say that the uh, collaboration is, is already excellent. We're seeing a lot of, I would say, joint interest in, in uh, key sectors. And we're also seeing uh, joint Nordic, Nordic, Baltic uh, interests in uh, a lot of these projects. And of course, some of these are policy areas where we have a, uh, an even broader uh, chapeau, so to say, uh, between our, our neighbors. Digitalization has been like an issue uh, for uh, several Nordic, Nordic Baltic EU chairmanships. Uh, the Nordic Council of Ministers had it very high on their agenda. Of course, the, the Prime Ministers met again, uh, I think it was on the 31st of October, uh, during the Nordic uh, Council meetings here, here in Oslo. Uh, and they keep uh, the dialogue open. Uh, one the, uh, subject they, they discussed, I know, I think, I know extensively, was uh, climate uh, and the role of uh, climate uh, and, of course, green uh, technology, uh, I think, linked to, linked to a lot of areas. And also on the policy side, how we can uh, work together, creating a, a stronger Nordic voice uh, on you know, such key issues, for example, during the Finnish uh, chairmanship of, of the EU and, and a part of the Finnish priorities. So the, the dialogue is, is good and it's uh, progressing, I would say. So. Thank you. Uh, I think what is the role of the authorities is really making uh, or creating a predictable environment for businesses then to work. Uh, we have tried to do that in Finland through our membership in the European Union. Uh, we are doing things in the context of the Nordic cooperation and of course in the context of the Arctic cooperation. Very important sector here and in, in many other regions is energy sector. Uh, I think we are going to see much more wind development, wind energy development, both in, in Norway and Finland, and the more predictable the conditions for this sector are, the more investments we are going to see because the businesses want to know that uh, what's the productivity of these investments, not today, not in only five years time, in, in, but in 20 and 30 years time. Uh, we are not yet there in every sector, but I think this is something which is very important. The same thing applies to the carbon trading in Europe. If the companies don't know what's the price of carbon, if they have no possibility of, of uh, predicting that, that's, that's no good. Uh, then we are trying to work on the infrastructure. It's quite amazing amount of fish which travels, the only time they travel anywhere, uh, uh, from the northern Norwegian uh, fish farms to Finland, through Finland, to European and other markets. If the roads are good, it's easier. If the roads are bad, it's more difficult. And that's the role of the public sector to take care of the roads, the railroads, the infrastructure, that it functions well and provides those uh, followers the possibility of, of transporting those things. I think the problem in this relationship is that the Helsinki and, and Oslo are far from each other. Uh, but then our regions in the north are very close to each other. And, and uh, somehow the capitals have not seen that how close we are. And I think that's something we have to overcome and make each other better known here, both in the, also in the, in the capital regions. I think that's really one of the challenges. You need not tell anybody in Kirkenes or Tromsø or Oulu or Rovaniemi that what's Norway, what's Finland. But when you come to Helsinki and Oslo, you know, we seem to be much further apart, and I think that's something we have to overcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, both Norway and Finland have thriving communities in the Arctic. Uh, I think that uh, one of the things that we have really learned when traveling with Arctic frontiers is that the knowledge about the Arctic often does not correspond with the interest and passion to preserve. And I usually say that the, the 
the passion to, to preserve is uh, reversed uh, proportional with the distance to the Arctic. <laughs> um, and many people seem to, to think that the Arctic is a pristine white area where there should be no industrial activity with help indigenous people. And the debate on indigenous people and traditional knowledge can be seen as part of this picture. Uh, how do you work through the Arctic Council and other international fora like the Arctic Science Ministerial to spread more knowledge and create the, 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 the correct picture among actors with strong opinions about the Arctic? You know, the sustainability is the key. On the other hand, we have to take care that uh, those people who want to earn their living in the north can also do that. Uh, we need for that more understanding of those processes in the nature. What really happens when you when you use the forest? How much carbon does it emit? How much you know you know the carbon cycle of forests is actually not so well known at the moment. I mean the, the assessments how much carbon is there, for example the Finnish forests vary so on. We need much, much more kind of real understanding of the, the processes of the nature. These things are relatively, relatively new. Uh, even though we have a lot of understanding, I think there is a lot of, lot of things to do. How does the uh, Arctic nature respond to increased CO2 in atmosphere? The common idea is that, you know, the warming will be much faster in the north, but, but understanding these processes, I think, is a key. And at the same time, we have to understand how these people can continue living, uh, sometimes finding new ways of, of employing themselves. I think one of the big questions for both of us, both of our countries, is sustainable tourism. Tourism as such, I think, is a good source of income for many of our citizens in the north. How to make tourism as sustainable as possible. You know, it's connected to transport, it's connected to how you build, you know, it's connected to many things. Uh, I mean, when we are thinking about, for example, building, you know, people are looking at how many euros or krona per square meter you pay, you have very little understanding of what kind of building you buy from the sustainability point of view. So I think you know, we need to work, we need to understand and think, and at the same time we have to develop our economies and our societies in the direction of a more sustainable future. I think it's doable, but uh, for, for that we need all the, all the, all the knowledge we can, we can together and with other partners to acquire. Thank you. Yeah. If I may just, just add a few words, because I think you are very right in, in pointing out that there is a lack of, of real understanding in broad international circles about what the Arctic is and what it isn't. Uh, and we see this, uh, I would say, and this is uh, my personal opinion, uh, as a recurring phenomenon in some circles, uh, especially in some European, European policy, uh, political circles. This is a debate that comes sort of up again on a regular basis. Uh, in Brussels, for example, in the European Parliament, and you have these re resolutions and, uh, and issues coming up. And sort of getting, uh, I would say from, from our experience, actually showing people what the Arctic in the, in the north of Norway, for example, is. This is a place where 10% of our population live. This is a place where they work, uh, they need jobs, they need education, they need uh, infrastructure and facilities. And how uh, combining protection and preservation with you know, sustainable development of the rich resources maintain or, and keeping uh, the, the, the value creation also locally, not just uh, a, a commodities-based economy sending things out, is really you know, showing that this is a living, vibrant uh, community. And again, in my, my personal experience, people are often surprised if you take them to, to, the, to the north of Norway, and I would guess also to the, to the north of Finland, you know, they're really seeing what this is and how uh, you know, people are working there, there are well-functioning societies, uh, and spreading you know, that uh, history has been you know, vitally important for, for us, and I, I guess also for, for Finland. And 
among the uh, Arctic states, uh, which all have you know, uh, communities uh, and people living uh, in this region uh, to various extents, uh, getting this history out is, is a really strategic communication. Uh, because, as I said, this is not really a, a white, pristine, unregulated yeah. uh, territory of, of the wilderness. And, um, yeah. Thank you, and I can really uh, uh, sign off to that, uh, the, the, the impression that people get when they come to, to Tromsø mm -hmm. and, and the rest of the, the northern uh, Scandinavian uh, cities are, are very often su being surprised. So I will now open the floor for, uh, for questions. Um, and as Hanna said, please keep, it, keep them short and to the point. So anybody? All the way in the back. Just, just a second. Uh, Harold Deerdahl from uh, Grenzland, a Norwegian wind power developer, uh, working up in the Arctic. Um, uh, very interesting comments and views on the Arctic, I fully agree. One topic that hasn't been touched is maybe one of the most important, and that is electrical infrastructure uh, in the north connecting, strengthening the, the, the system between Norway and Finland, and that would be a prerequisite for any uh, large-scale um, industrial development in the Arctic, both in Norway and Finland. Can you comment a little bit on that? Okay, okay. <laughs> well, well I, I have to admit I'm not, I'm not a subject expert on, uh, on electrical grids, but I think this is obviously uh, an issue that you see, uh, I think, not only in the Arctic, but in a lot of regional regions of Europe, where you have the grids really not aligned with the, the needs and the uh, of today, and much less of the future. So uh, I think this is something where uh, we need to work within the various frameworks we we have. Uh, I would say that the EU uh, dimension of this is is going to be important with the development of the of the EU uh, side. Uh, but of course, it's, uh, if you are to develop uh, the region in a forward-looking uh, matter, actually getting uh, cross-border infrastructure of various kinds, uh, including, I believe, energy grids, uh, is going to be important. So. I, I think you touch upon really an important question, because this is exactly kind of infrastructure, you know. The states or state-owned companies are responsible for if you don't have the electricity networks, you're not going to build any wind power stations. You have to know, know that. Uh, the big challenge in, in this sector is that in our societies, we have created uh, procedures which make everything take a very, very long time. Uh, we have a quite good connectivity with Sweden. Now we are planning a new uh, electric connection to Sweden and the target time is 24 to 2024 it's quite a, quite a long time uh, I think we could do much better in uh, in uh, streamlining those processes because it's a uh, all too long time for a for a company to wait to be uh, connected to, to something so I think the governments could do here a, a better role in, in uh, regulating and also uh, creating conditions for those who are investing in, in uh, sustainable uh, energy. Otherwise, those investments won't arrive. So um, I think Stuxnet and, and FinGrid could and should talk about these things, you know, have a, have a common idea what to do. Uh, of course, it requires money, but then I think you know, this kind of problems should be possible to overcome. Thank you. Yes, please. Just wait, wait for the main microphone. My name is uh, Jenny Spring, and I represent the Norwegian Bar and Secretariat in Kirkenes. Um, now we see a huge development in the Arctic and Particular in, particularly in the Russian part of the Arctic. We see the biggest infrastructure project in the, just outside Murmansk, where they are building a huge harbor uh, for the oil and gas industry. Um, 
But what are we doing in Norway? For example, in regard to the Norton Sea route, in regard to the Arctic Railway connection from Rovaniemi to Kirkenes, and so on. If we don't start developing now, it will be too late for us. The Russians will have already built all their harbors and maritime ports and infrastructure. So what is your comments on that? That was one for you. Uh, yes. No, as I mentioned in my remarks, there are some 40 billion Norwegian kroner in the infrastructure developments in the three northernmost counties of Norway in the coming or in the uh, current uh, national transport plan. Uh, I think the issue of uh, both the the uh, roads, but also the the uh, the harbors, especially, is uh, is an important one. Uh, and of course, the uh, I would say the the sizes are not necessarily com comparable, I think, given the 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 state of uh, of the Russian uh, market uh, right now. Uh, but of course, this is uh, very high uh, on our agenda. That's why we are investing uh, heavily in it. Uh, you have uh, you have uh, seen, uh, I would say, uh, substantial infrastructure investments uh, already, and they and they will continue. So um, I understand there is always a wish uh, for more, but I would say that the Norwegian government is is uh, following and and. Uh, uh, doing uh, a lot of these necessary investments already, so. Thank you, Anton, you would like uh, to follow up on that? Yeah, I'm not going to comment on the Norwegian <laughs> side because uh, I know probably the Russia better. <laughs> but I think what we have to understand is Russia is going to, is kind of being economically connected to the outside world. Big projects are being built in, in Yamal, opposite side of the, of the Ob uh, Bay, in other places in Murmansk and uh, then we have to also understand that Russia is a very Arctic country. Uh, according to the president of Russia, 10% of uh, Russia's GDP comes from the Arctic. And that Arctic has to be connected to the world because you know they are producing certain energy or other products and they have to find a market. And the market is not just inside Russia, but it's also, also in the outside world. And I think there is not so much infrastructure in that region, so it's quite understandable that uh, Russia wants to build infrastructure ports, uh, railroads uh, uh, and uh, roads in the region where you have really not so many roads, not so many railroads and not so many infrastructure, not so much infrastructure at the moment. So I think it's a it's kind of a natural thing. I don't think that's uh, so much in competition with, uh, with, with Nordic countries, Finland or Norway, but it's just kind of for the needs of, uh, of the country itself. Yeah, thank you. We have more questions. This is uh, very interesting. This is not, my name is Tom Klepper, sir. I'm here today for Ocean Industry Forum Oslofjord, which is my term for Oslo. Uh, this is just an observation. Um, when I was a young student at the Norwegian School of Economics in Bergen, I had the opportunity to participate in the first Northern Sea Route meetings uh, taking place in June 1990. Uh, that was very exciting. That was the the first startup between Norway and Russia uh, for what was later the Northern International Sea Route Project. Um, last week I was in Helsinki, and going back to, to 1990 again, the, the thing then was that Murmansk Shipping Company had its nuclear icebreakers. And the director of the Murmansk Shipping Company was uh, in Oslo in 1990, and the whole plan was to use the icebreakers to open up the, the Northern Sea Route. And when I was in Helsinki last week, um, there were two of those icebreakers still in the port of Helsinki. So I had this deja vu of 1990, and apparently uh, there's still icebreakers, nuclear icebreakers uh, from Murmansk Shipping Company in, in Helsinki. So I don't know if they are still being used to, it was not, it was, they looked very much like the ones we saw back in 1990. But I think it's interesting because in 1990, you know, the world was so different, uh, it seemed very different. And it was a big, big, uh, big world back then before the internet and everything. And, and uh, here we are 20 years later, and it's very interesting to take this topic up right now. Uh, the Russian nuclear icebreakers are based in Murmansk, not in Helsinki. We have our own icebreakers, and they are there in the in the center of Helsinki, opposite the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I think there are seven of them, and they are there uh, most part of the year. Only in the winter months they are going away, but uh, I can assure you that 
the Russian nuclear icebreakers, they are, they are based in, in Murmansk or some other places in, in Russia, not in Helsinki. Uh, but uh, in Helsinki shipyard, we have built some of those nuclear icebreakers and then the nuclear reactor and all that uh, equipment has been then, you know, it, that equipment has been then uh, put on those ships in, uh, in, 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 the, in the then Soviet Union. So, uh, that, you know, that's kind of the part of the story, but those icebreakers which are in Helsinki, are, they are mostly diesel driven and then we have the first ever glo globally LNG driven icebreaker in, in Finland as well, which was made in Helsinki shipyard, where most of the icebreakers of the world have been built. One more question before we sum up. Okay, I have uh, one question then. Um, we uh, have been discussing Russia now and uh, we are witnessing uh, a close and constructive cooperation and dialogue with Russia in and on the Arctic, business issues and Northern Sea Route and so on. However, there is a tendency to describe the relation with Russia as frozen. What would be your comment to this? Maybe you would like to start, uh, I don't know. I don't think frozen is a good metaphor. It has been you know, changed uh, over the last uh, four or five years as a result of Russian actions in the international system. Uh, and of course, the, the relationship between Norway and Russia uh, and the, the, the development in the relationship between Norway and Russia uh, over the last, let's say, five years is a function of Russia's relationship to the outside world, not of a result of uh, events or developments in the bilateral relationship as such, because Norway's position as a strong ally, ally as a strong partner to our European friends, as a part of the Western community of, of values and interests, is, uh, you know, that is not up for discussion. So for us, uh, we are fully aligned with the EU restrictive measures, for example. Uh, we have uh, been a, a um, major driver for the ongoing reforms and adaptations of, of NATO's uh, structures and, and posture. Uh, and I think in light of, of uh, the Russian actions, these have been uh, and are uh, you know, very important and necessary steps. But on the other side, Russia is our neighbor. It will always be our neighbor. And maintaining, developing a pragmatic, practical cooperation on the issues of joint uh, interests uh, will always be a key Norwegian interest. Because there are uh, issues that we can only handle together. And actually managing those questions are also an important part of our security policy. So that is why even though we, uh, as one example, even though we suspended the military to military uh, cooperation, we maintain uh, a lot of the ongoing practical coordination and cooperation on border uh, management, on Coast Guard cooperation, on search and rescue in the north, because these are you know, genuinely uh, areas of, of joint interest. And also maintaining uh, the uh, practical cooperation within these formal frameworks of the bilateral commissions. Nuclear safety, for example, is uh, an important vitally important issue regardless of the international circumstances. Uh, the environment, fisheries management, which I mentioned, uh, and also uh, trade and uh, economic uh, cooperation within the frameworks now set by the, uh, by the uh, uh, reciprocal uh, sanctions and, and uh, restrictive measures. Uh, that has been important. And there is, you know, we aim to maintain that cooperation uh, as well as we can given the circumstances and also have a good uh, political dialogue. So this fall, Prime Minister Medvedev and Prime Minister Solberg met in Brussels. Uh, I spent a week in Russia in September. We had meetings um, with uh, on the ministerial level within all the commissions. So there is a, uh, it's not frozen, uh, but it is uh, of course uh, influenced by the international circumstances. Uh, a few words on, on Finnish-Russian uh, relations. 
you know, as Norway, we are a neighbor and we want to be a neighbor as well. Uh, we have some joint interests, of course, because of we are neighbors, we have to keep this border working, we have to keep transport working, we have interest in environment and, and trade and, and investments. So they are there uh, as long as, as, as we can see. On the other hand, we are a member of the European Union. We are participating in form formulating European Union policies and we are also implementing those policies. And we all know that the situation around Ukraine has changed quite a lot. Uh, the atmosphere in Europe, and that's something we have to recognize. And you know, these two elements are are here, and they will be will be also in the future. And let's hope that uh, at least the the conflict in eastern part of Ukraine would tone down, and and we would get a more peaceful situation in eastern Ukraine. I think that would help to to alleviate this atmosphere. But as long as we are here, it's very difficult to see big steps forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. You. And uh, it looks like the, the possibility for good and uh, smart development in the Arctic is still strong. So thank you very much, State Secretary Erdogan Halvos and Matti Antonen. Thank you. And now it's my... my pleasure uh, to give the, the floor to uh, the, the moderator for the next two sessions, which is more business oriented. Uh, Arctic Frontiers, good friend, my friend Arne Fredriksson. Please, the floor is yours. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. And also welcome to those following us through this live stream. We already got a little glimpse of the Arctic earlier this morning. It's an area with increased interest and increased importance. According to Guggenheim Partners, a US-based investment company, the Arctic holds an investment potential of one trillion US dollars. The Lapland Chamber of Commerce in Finland estimates that Arctic Europe holds an investment potential of 162 billion euros. 76 billion euros of this is estimated to be in Finland and in Norway. It's a region with 20% of the global natural resources, 15% of the landmass, but also only a fraction of the population. We're talking about 0.05%. It's also a region where we have a track record of resource utilization, which is really on top of the world. But we know it is a demanding region for operations. So this morning, we will discuss what attracts businesses to engage in activity in the high north. And how do they see the long-term business prospects in the Arctic. We have an opportunity to hear from an excellent lineup. We have Equinor, Arctic Solutions, ST1, and Startnet represented in the first panel. And without any further delay, I am pleased to introduce our first speaker. He represents Arctic Solutions, a company which can boast with a mixture of Arctic capabilities, energy development solutions from subsea to surface, offshore wind, an article for farming. Senior Vice President Henrik Hannes works with product development, operations, and business development. Henrik, the floor is yours.
yes or no? Uh, I'll, I'll see if I can uh, reposition. Okay. Um, our prime business is oil and gas services, but we buy it now sustainably for future generations. So we are in a transition. We want to improve on where we are uh, within the oil and gas service and within working towards new regions. Our company is about 14,000 employees, so about half in Norway and the rest in typically in the oil and, and uh, gas regions. Um, we cover most of the oil and gas service, meaning that we start with uh, the early phase development and we work, work through to project execution and finally into the decommissioning and taking the, the fields off the grid. That means that we have in our company a lot of different competences, both in, in project execution, in, in various building blocks of, of the platforms, and within the subsea equipment, within maintenance and operation of platforms. So we think all of these can be, we can utilize also towards other regions. And I think uh, having a background in North Sea, we are used to working in the complex tasks. That means that we think that we can take on, on uh, difficult activities safely, which again is very, very relevant to the Arctic. We have to assure that we have a safety level at least as good as in other regions. Um, going to, to, to the business that we do, which is again in the Arctic, it is development. It's about 200 kilometers north of, of Norway, over the coastline. It is a very large development, producing about 190,000 barrels a day. Um, we have been involved in this project for since 2012, starting with early phase studies, working our way through concept development, front-end engineering, and detailed design. We are currently working on, on a uh, engineering procurement management assistant contract. The project has taken a long time because it's been through value enhancement phases. In the end, the concept is not hugely different from what we see in, in other parts of the North Sea, but of course we have to account for, for, for the, for the uh, protecting the, the working environment on board and some eyes, sea eyes. But um, sort of the shift to, towards sustainability, uh, we are also working on other, other solutions that, that uh, lead us to the low carbon future. I think one particular area is offshore wind. We talked about it. We mentioned the wind as, as being part of the Arctic. We're also working quite a bit on electrification of the installations that are, are in, in, in oil and gas that will reduce the CO2 emissions from, from the developments and then by minimizing the environmental footprint. We also have a special technology in carbon capture that is taking out uh, the, the CO2 emissions out of, 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 of the exhaust. And we wish to develop this and to, to also reuse the, the CO2 for, for, for uh, different purposes. And we are now uh, in, in working in a pilot stage and we've developed a pilot uh, that is uh, standardized and modular so we can move this to different uh, carbon capture uh, experiments. We also strengthen our capabilities in gas, uh, as many see the gas as being a sort of the bridge towards low carbon as a transition phase. So we developed in particular technology for subsea gas compression, which will bring more gas out of the fields and we will eventually replace first coal and then oil with gas. So this is all part of the development that we are going on. Um, now, particular to, to the wind, our, our target is the floating wind. That is because we have kept all wind in, in float. All we work is offshore. So floating is where we are, we are at home. We have teamed up with an American small startup com company called Principal Power. And they have a, a concept called wind float, which is uh, in our view, we can play on all the developing floating wind. Technically, it's a semi-submersible platform with uh, heat plates and ballasting. Again, components that we see in our offshore arena. They've had a pilot installed in Portugal for five years. That has now moved to Scotland, and it's, it's again operational there. 
and we will continue to develop this into to bigger, more commercial parks as we see in, in the fixed offshore wind today. How this will be used in the Arctic remains to be seen. The benefits of this opening wind that, that we can move away from, from the shore, so it won't cause any, any uh, impact on the visual or on the noise or on maybe on, on things like birds, birds uh, activities. The final thing that we do that we think is rather relevant, it's called Arctic Offshore Farming Project. And the, the uh, farming in Norway is extremely important. It produces about 60-65% of the world's consumption of salmon. Uh, the status today is basically fjords are getting full. Uh, there is concern about the seas, there's concern about the, the, the environmental disturbances of the ocean. We will go further out. We think it's, it's, it's uh, less of a concern. We, we have more area available. And in particular, addressing the, 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 the um, concerns about, about the disease. This, this particular concept, we, we, we uh, submerge the, the net cage. So it's all underwater. That mean, should mean that it's more difficult for diseases to find the fish, or particularly salmon lice, so that they can find the fish. And, and also, if you go out to the sea, uh, I've learned now that salmon do get seasick. So if we, we do get the, the salmon sent to deeper, there's less wave effect, so they don't get sick. Um, this project is, is about to start pretty soon, publication. And we think, again, uh, going back to Finland, I've learned uh, last time I was in Finland, there's a lack of whitefish, uh, seek or seeka in Finland, so maybe this could be a project for Finland as well. Thank you. And that was perfectly on time. We had a question earlier this morning about the electricity network, and therefore it is a great pleasure to introduce our next speaker representing Startnet. Startnet has made significant investments in infrastructure and grid development lately. Some current examples are Moodlink, a subsea cable connecting German and Norwegian electricity markets, but you have also recently concluded a new power line in northern Norway. Um, our speaker, holds the position of Head of Customer and Public Affairs at Startnet. He joined the company in 2010. Prior to that, he gained broad experience from oil and gas industry, power consuming industry, and power production both in Norway and abroad. Erik Sjeldred, is the future electric? Uh, for certain, uh, I would say the future is electric. We have said that for several years, and we really believe strongly in it. Uh, thank you for being invited. Uh, good to see you all. Uh, Startnet, a uh, few words about that. We are the Norwegian transmission system operator. That's meaning we've got the responsibility for the security of supply in Norway. We're also owner of the uh, grid connecting the different kind of areas in Norway together. Uh, the grid at the highest voltage levels. The Arctic, um, I would say that Alta and the high north is one of our key areas. We got our operation center in Alta, uh, where we operate half of the Norwegian grid, so down to further down than mid Norway, a little, little middle of on the, on the west, west coast of Norway, operated by Alta and the high north. Also, choosing this picture from our opening today, it's a lot of questions around um, the, the tough climate in, in the high north and the Arctic climate. But it's also possible to take advantage of it. This, uh, in the high north, we're doing uh, somewhat else uh, and different construction method. Doing a lot of the transportation uh, on our construction work in the winter time. Uh, this is steel being transported out for constructing new pilings. So it's also advantages if you're able to operate uh, and take advantages of it. Uh, 
this is one of the regions where we have done most grid investments on the Norwegian side. Uh, we've got a common Nordic grid, the Finnish grid, north south, we've got the Swedish grid, the east west, which now are uh, at least under permitting or discussions for being upgraded. And on top of that, we got Norwegian grid, binding it all together uh, within a, what we could call an Arctic ring. Uh, investments on the Norwegian side. Uh, first, we uh, increased the capacity from the Russian border uh, to the west in Varangabotten. Then we started to increase capacity from Ufoten to Balsfjord, and now it's working us towards the north, up to Skydi, and we're also in discussions with the oil and gas industry, how to meet the growing consumptions in Hammer. Uh, and if they're going further, we're going to construct further down up to, to Hammerfest. If you look into what's going on on the electrical side for the moment. Uh, last year, we saw a really high growth in people, projects, uh, companies seeing us to have new grid connections or increase their capacity. It's mostly wind power, IT centers, oil and gas industry, but also conventional industry. You see the race here in, in companies asking for grid connections. Uh, we see the same trend as for the northern uh, region uh, and the Arctic and the high north. When we look into the transmission grid, uh, it's important to remember uh, and draw the focus on it's a common Nordic grid. We are within the same synchronous area. Uh, you could say the north-south sink uh, for power flow goes to Sweden, so that is, of course, uh, very important. We see new wind projects throughout the whole Scandinavia. When you look into the high north region, we recognize that it's, uh, it's a very low power Accordingly, the grid is quite uh, weak, but it's a lot of new wind projects knocking the door also in that week. Of course, we will develop this together with, with uh, different power companies and, uh, and the consumers. Uh, but with this kind of situation, uh, we easily end out in a situation where we, if we have a large power uh, surplus in the region, we will see lower power prices. To the producers, that's a disadvantage, but it's also a possibility for new industry, new power consumers. So it remains to be seen uh, how that will develop it further. Uh, we also need to see this together with the Norwegian authorities, their plan for wind power developments in Norway. And I would like to remind that a lot of studies ongoing between three Norwegian ESOs. Uh, we're studying uh, together because it's a common grid and we intend to develop this uh, further together as we operate it. Uh, a last thing, uh, early this year we put together a new task force uh, in Norway together with a lot of Norwegian state-owned company uh, and we're in discussions with a lot of companies outside this group to see and better understand uh, what's going on, what can these advantages in the region B. Um, uh, the aim of this study uh, is to create uh, or draw up a roadmap for further green 
grid development uh, by first quarter next year. But one thing I'm very sure about is that the way forward, the key to a good way forward, is good cooperation uh, with all uh, among, you could say, the Nordic grid companies and all the customers, uh, both the power consuming and the new wind power. We need to cooperate and take this further in a good way. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. The next company we will be hearing from has the vision to be the leading producer and seller of CO2 aware energy. SD1 operates in Finland, Sweden, and Norway. They produce biofuels from waste and residues, generate heat from earth, and produce power from wind. Our speaker is SD1's Director of Renewable Energy, Thomas Hansen. Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and, and thanks for being given the opportunity to speak. I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit. Uh, I'll start with what we do in our nonprofit uh, vision actually means. First of all, is the realization that fossil energy is going to be with us for a long time yet. Well, our job uh, and what we're trying to do as a company that has a significant position in uh, the refining and marketing of traditional oil product is to use that presence and use the to commercialize energy solutions that reduces the CO2 intensity of our energy mix. Last year, uh, we spent roughly 80% of our returns on investment in re uh, renewable energy, uh, in heating, in, in power production, and in um, biofuels production. Uh, when it comes to electricity production in a Nordic context, we're, we're big believers in wind. We've built roughly 500 megawatts uh, through a joint venture with a partner in Finland. Uh, and uh, we're very strong believers in the long-term potential of wind power in delivering what the Nordic needs in its power, power mix in the years to come. Now, one of the things that the Nordics will need in the years to come is significantly more than what it currently has. Uh, the Swedish energy authorities has estimated that up until 2045, we need roughly 100 terawatts of new renewable energy. That equals, uh, uh, just to give that a perspective, that's uh, the current consumption in Finland uh, presently is around 80 terawatts. In Norway, we produce between 100 and 130 ter terawatts. Uh, Finland's energy mix today is still roughly 20% fossil, and they import 25% of their consumption. The other big thing here uh, that, that hasn't really sunk in yet is that wind is the cheapest form of new electricity. It's not the cheapest form of new renewable electricity, it's the cheapest form of electricity, period. And that's significant. Now, where do we find the cheapest wind power? Topically, and probably, hopefully not a surprise, it's in the Nordic Arctic. This picture is from uh, Rakocharu, or uh, It has been consistently built in 2014, which in wind terms is an eel, the best performing wind park in Europe. It still is. It's getting competition now from another a small, relatively small investment in the same in the same area. But if you're a wind nerd, you can rattle up numbers uh, about this part that that makes any investor salivate. Um, key question though is why is there only 130 megawatts built in that region? out of several thousand new builds over the last years in, in, in the Nordic region. First reason, and we've spoken a little bit about it today, is infrastructure. And specifically, it's grid. It's not ports or roads or any of these things, it's grid. 
There's not any more capacity in the grid in eastern Finnmark to neither absorb any new production or actually facilitate new consumption now that uh, the, the mine in eastern Finnmark in the Kirkenes area is, is starting up again. Uh, and I think we have the solution to this, and it's fairly simple, it's not easy. But the solution is to build a wind farm which is big enough that the cost of energy differential justifies the investments needed in order to build the grid. So it's the reverse of the traditional thinking around these things, which is like you build the power production close to the cons uh, consumption. What, what we look at is where is renewable electricity production cheaper and can I economically bring it to the market where it's needed today? And if you compare the Arctic region to further south where today there is consumption, you can easily make that calculation come through basically because the energy is so much cheaper. Now, I have to kind of emphasize here a bit because to me, sitting in my office at Skyen, that, that was readily apparent to me when I started looking at this. I mean, we, we as a company that already built 500 megawatt we, in, in the south, we know what it's cost and I'm looking at uh, uh, details around the resource and what it means in terms of money in the north, that's obvious. But what I learned, having spent time now in trying to develop a project, is obviously there's a different angle here because it's not just wind power development or new renewable power production that's hampered by lack of infrastructure specifically grid it's also regional development and i think we've covered that today but also i think if we just approach this a little bit differently we can make this hang together pretty nicely uh, the egg basically has to come first in this chicken and egg thing. And because of this cost of energy differential, that, that egg is already there. The second challenge uh, that our little project illustrates is of course that in addition to having Europe's best wind, uh, wind resource, it also has the only conditions that are required to uh, required for the regional Sami population to sustain a way of life and culture that is built around the area. All I can say of this topic, and we can get into it a little bit more on the debate, is that um, we've learned a lot for the two or so years that we've been working this. Um, we still have some way to go. Uh, we've come far. Um, the key that I've learned is basically the importance of local presence. I think that's obvious. It's also important to be able to take a very, very long-term view and to have patience because things in our interaction with Sami population doesn't necessarily operate to my or our calendar here in Oslo and we gotta accommodate that. Uh, you also, in that interaction and in that dialogue, you have to actually reflect that it is a true dialogue. And our project today, as a result of that dialogue, looks significantly different than it did 12 months ago. And it most likely will look different 12 months from now from what it does today. And that's it uh, for me. I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. Thank you, Thomas. There's been a slight change in the program. Tove Lind, the sustainable, sustainability manager of Johan Kasberg Field of Equinor, is not able to join us, but we are extremely pleased to welcome senior advisor Catherine Jarden Nielsen of Equinor Arctic. She has 25 years of experience in upstream oil and gas industry. This experience also includes onshore and nuclear industries. She's a lady with a strong international background. Uh, she works at the at Equinor. She works with strategy, policy, and technology related to Arctic. 
She's also the chair of the International Association of Oil and Gas Producers Arctic Committee. She has a declared love for the Arctic, though she lives in Oslo. She says she'd love to move further up north, but she can't get her husband to relocate with her. Catherine, we look forward to hearing more of Equinor's work. Thank you, Anu. Um, so, um, I'm here uh, standing in front, in front of you thinking I was going to be in the audience today. Uh, so, forgive me if I'm a little unprepared. Um, so, I've been asked to say a few words about how Equinor views activity in the Arctic. So, I'm going to cover a large area. It's a little, it's what I think may be useful for you to hear, but we can have a lot of questions afterwards. So, a little bit about Equinor first. Uh, I see that the formatting has changed since it was sent in the early hours of the morning. Um, so, we are Equinor. Uh, a lot of people will remember us as Statoil. We changed our name earlier this year to reflect our ambitions to grow, uh, to be a broader energy company, recognizing all the global challenges that are around us. And our vision is, as I'm sure many have heard, to change, to shape the energy future. And that means that we want to positive, positively be part of the energy transition and not to hinder it, to stick to all the old things that we know. And our top level strategy to do this is always safe, high value, low carbon. And it sounds so simple and it sounds so obvious, but actually a huge amount of work went into these words, um, in, especially when you recognize that a strategy is different from a vision. Strategy has to be doable, achievable. You've got to have actions for it. So we have our actions, um, different regions, technologies, different areas um, of um, types of resources, such as uh, IM safety. We have our climate roadmap, which I could spend a whole presentation on today, but I'm not going to. So before I say anything else, I just want to say that I realize, and having been in Finland and had people protest against me in Finland, uh, and our company, I realize that people have views on our industry and the pace of change in the energy transition. But actually, I'm very proud to work for Equinor, having been around the world, seen different industries, different companies, um, and that we are transparent, forward-looking, and implementing strategies to be the best that we can, which is what I want to share with you and how we take this into the Arctic. So this is a map of the world, as you can see. It shows that we are present in more than 30 countries around the world with 20,000 colleagues. So why am I showing you this? I'm showing you this because one of the questions we were given is why are we attracted to the Arctic? And I would turn that around and say, well, why wouldn't we be attracted to the Arctic? <clears throat> is it because people think it's too harsh, it's too remote, it's too costly, it's too environmentally sensitive? And actually, when I, I would say that having looked at many of these places before, there are many of them that fit that description around the world. That's not an exclusively Arctic description. Uh, we evaluate each area differently. So having worked around the world, but having worked in almost all of the countries of the Arctic except Iceland, um, I think it's the term the Arctic is very misleading. So the one message that I always like to leave people with is that there is not one Arctic. It's different cultures, different physical, ecological environments, different resources with different levels of challenge to find and develop. Some places in the Arctic are extremely workable for our industry, for other industries, and some areas are less workable. So I'd also like to say some regions in the North really want development and our position is that they should have a say about getting that development. So, why are we attracted to the Arctic as an energy company? Well, there are a lot of quality energy resources in the Arctic, and in fact, the Arctic isn't such a new place to be. There's a lot of existing technologies for working in the Arctic, but we do need more. So, we are attracted to places in the Arctic that fit in with our vision and our strategy. So with our always safe, um, high value, low carbon, can the Arctic really play a role here? When, particularly when we work a lot with oil and gas, um, 
then people have concerns about the emissions from, from our sources. There I want to say is that we, we accept uh, the consensus on climate, man-made climate change and we support fully the Paris Climate Agreement. We do so much work looking at future energy needs to continue the supplies to 2030, um, but we really see the need to be ambitious but also pragmatic to get the best resources across from multiple energy, energy sectors. So we have our strategy, which you've seen, and we want to work across all these energy sectors, being the best we can be, particularly when it comes to oil and gas. And we really believe that the Arctic has a place here. So we can be in the Arctic on the Norwegian continental shelf, which I'll talk a bit more about now. We have been, and we will be again in the future, in the Arctic and international oil and gas. Uh, and we have uh, significant new energy solutions, some of which are focused on the Arctic, I'm not going to talk about today. But of course, we do offshore wind. We've been doing carbon capture and storage for over 20 years. Uh, and we look at the hydrogen value chain, which also we've been looking at an Arctic application for that. So I'm going to talk specifically about the Norwegian Arctic now and specifically about oil and gas very quickly. So we see the Norwegian sector as what we would call a stepwise approach, and that's really well supported by stable, visionary regulatory framework um, so that pushes for good economic development with continuous improvements. So that really makes Norway um, a world leader, and I can say that as a non-Norwegian. So. And there was a time when everybody believed that the Norwegian sector didn't have any oil and gas. And then there was a time when people thought it was far too harsh to develop it. And then 50 years later, we have moved further north, uh, developed safely, become a leader in environmental management, subsea technology, uh, with a model economic system. To continue to supply to 2030, we need new resources. And the Barents Sea, in fact, the Arctic covers part of the Norwegian Sea and the Barents Sea, provides a huge amount of these resources. But it's not new. So we have been, Norna is technically Arctic. Um, that license, would, that field was discovered in 92 and it's produced since 1997. So producing oil and gas in the Norwegian Arctic is not new. Um, we have Snowbeat, producing since 1997 with LNG. Uh, we have Oster Hanstein just coming online now, 300 kilometers offshore, giving gas to Europe, and Johan Kasberg. And then after Johan Kasberg, it would be Wisting. So here we are far up, I should use the pointer, I'm sure. Um, far up here in the north. And we continue to ex uh, dis explore around these discoveries. So overall, um, we've moved stepwise with technology, but we see the northern areas as a key part of sustaining the Norwegian continental shelf uh, in line with our strategy and to support development of local people. So as I move on and put up a nice picture of Johan Kasberg, um, then I'll just say that, of course, going north, we have the history doing it, but it is, we do continuously need more. We need more because the global setting changes in terms of technologies. Um, but also because there is, a, we are changing the environment and the conditions that we work in. So remoteness uh, continues to be uh, a challenge for us. We have the low carbon setting, so we need to continuously have technologies for that. Uh, we need continuous improvement in environmental and environmental safety, uh, and we need to manage this within a price volatile market. And there's a number of areas where Finnish technology uh, or Finnish business can really contribute to that. Um, digital solutions, greener logistics, battery ships with alternative fuels, um, technologies with waste to heat. But also, don't just look at the facilities we produce. The thing we also want is we want to have um, fields, uh, cities in the north where people want to live. Because when we look at Johan Kospo, we are creating uh, around 47,000 to 50,000 man years of work just in the development phase and um, many years of man years work in the operations phase, 500 man years per year in the north, and we need people to live in this location, in the locations to work on these fields. 
So I did was going to say a bit about Johann Kassberg, but I think we've already covered it. Um, it's mainly a subsea field. Um, you see the ship, everyone sees the FSO, but really the technology is under the sea, where we will tie in many more fields. So I haven't quite finished. Last slide. Can I just get that quickly. Yeah. So really, you know, we are in the Arctic. It's attractive. Um, we would say that we should continue as businesses to be in the Arctic as long as we, we are selective about where we want to be and the different businesses that we're in. It's really important to have a, understand the license to operate what our st shareholders want, but also what all stakeholders want, the local populations, the administrations. Um, this is, these two, well, all these three are really big ones, but it's really important technologically to know what you need many years in advance. And this is what I work with most of the time, is to know that when you get to find, make you discover a field, that's not the time to say, oh, I need this technology. You need to know before you're even in that license that you need that technology. That's what we've done with many of the technologies in Johann Kasberg. And everything that we do should actively support the Paris Agreement towards low carbon. Another area where we expect that Finnish businesses and technologies can provide those, those step changes or even incremental changes to make us better at everything we do. Yeah. I would like to invite the other panelists <laughs> to join us. And while the other panelists take the stage and join Just Catherine, uh, I would like to encourage our audience to start preparing questions. Again, I repeat what Hema said earlier. Uh, short, concise <laughs> questions. We will start up with a few questions to the panel, but I will open the floor quite early on. So first and foremost, thank you all for providing us with an excellent overview of activities in the Arctic. Uh, Catherine touched upon it. It's important to emphasize that there is not just one Arctic, but actually several different operating conditions within this one region. But it's also important to bear in mind that there is a difference between operating onshore and operating offshore. My question to you is, we've heard a lot of good technology which already exists, but do we have a demonstrated capability of operating in the Arctic? Well, I mean, absolutely. Uh, we have it in the Norwegian sector for over 20 years. Um, and I think the, the key for us there has been, as I said, the, the stable framework that allows innovation, um, but also that we don't jump out at the deep end, literally. We take this incremental change with continuous improvement. But it's not just the Norwegian Arctic. You know, you look uh, around, around the world and we see there are technologies Arctic relevant technologies elsewhere, such as East Coast Canada, um, but there's also plenty of technologies uh, in the Arctic US, um, for example, uh, in Arctic Russia even, but are under sanction now, of course. So absolutely, yeah. I would say that, yes, we have been operating the Arctic for quite some time, and, and I think uh, we have been, been without serious incidents, uh, of course, Last week only there was a, a severe storm hitting uh, Newfoundland and there was at the startup a damage on the zeros. We work on, on the zeros uh, FPSO, the ship, but we don't know this was a subsea related uh, damage. So I, th I think uh, at, at always, yes, we can do it, but we always have to keep uh, an open mind for improving and, and looking into what can go wrong. And again, uh, as Katarin already mentioned, there is a license to operate and a license to be there. We cannot afford serious incidents. We used to operate in the Arctic, I would say. Um, it's a uh, lot of time discussions about the harsh climate. Uh, we see that operating in the southern part of Norway, up in the mountains, some part of the western coast is tougher than operating in the, in the, in the Arctic. Uh, 
Also, the Sami people is uh, also one of the discussions that we used to meet the Sami people in half of Norway. So, we also used to handle with them. Mm -hmm. Thomas, did you want to add up on that? Yeah, I think, mm -hmm. you know, from our perspective, technology is not really a hurdle where we're at. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's there already, it's proven, that's not a challenge. I think just to play off a little bit on, on the point that there isn't one Arctic, um, if the Nordic Arctic region has a call it, um, comparative advantage to other Arctic regions, it is that it's relatively uh, easily accessible and uh, uh, also from a climate perspective, it's, it's, it's an easier operating environment than other Arctic regions in the world. Now in there, of course, and, and leading in the development of the region uh, from uh, and, and the Nordics, we also obviously gain experience in open markets uh, that are that are um, that we can export, which I'm, I'm sure is uh, is your experience. Uh, several of you touched upon the, the what I would call the social license to operate in the Arctic. Um, it's a region with four million inhabitants in eight different countries. And it's necessary, in my opinion, to have dialogue with them. But how do you secure local content? And how do you go about with creating the dialogue? ST1, do you have, for example, any best practices in terms of your development? That's a, it's, it's a very, very good question. Uh, question. I think from, from our perspective here, we're learning a bit as we go along. And I think... Uh, uh, it, it, it's a lot about having an open mind, as I also mentioned, sort of uh, uh, patience and persistence, willing to listen uh, and actually change. So, so, so that it's a real dialogue. It's not just dialogue as a nice buzzword in some social engagement thing. It's a dialogue about, okay, what will this look like? How do we tailor it to, to, to ensure that it benefits everyone to as large uh, to as large a degree as as possible. Mm -hmm. um, how the, the house around there is 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 I, I have to admit is a little bit tricky. It's um, uh, there are multiple stakeholders uh, and it's an area that whose which sensitivity we got we got acknowledge um, and I think. Our attitude as a company and, and also with this project, we try and take that extremely, extremely seriously and allow ourselves to take the time in order to make that a good process, which is why it takes time. But if we look at the business structure of, for example, Northern Finland or North of Norway, the majority of our businesses in the Arctic are small and medium sized businesses. You represent the big players. Um, how do you collaborate with them or can you collaborate with them? And if so, what does it take in terms of competence building, capacity, etc.? I think uh, from our perspective, um, we, it takes a lot of planning in advance. Uh, so first of all, I think you have to um, accept and, and really buy into the fact that it's the right thing to do, but it's also absolutely key to acceptance um, that you have local economic development, but it's also very good for business because it's uh, it's a local workshop workforce, it's local um, local markets. So so that's good economically for, for business for us to have it locally. But uh, I think what we saw is that we had to start very early in in working with suppliers in particular and telling them what sort of services we'd like, but also how to pre-qualify. Um, for, for our operations, so that rather than just putting out a contract and say, well, you're equally welcome to apply for it uh, as anyone else, to help them uh, in understanding that what was coming and the standards that we required and helping them to meet those standards so that they could compete. It is Shelter. Um, I mentioned that we had our operations uh, for half of Norway from Alta. Uh, earlier, we had three operation centers, one in Oslo, one in Mid-Norway, and the one in Alta in the north. Uh, what we learned during the years is that it's easier to employ and attract highly educated people in Alta than in Mid-Norway. So, just do it. <laughs> just do it. <laughs> uh, how do you go by? 
because no, the, let's say the young generation of today is really about urbanization. They want the modern services. Uh, do you have any tricks as a company as to how you can make sure that the living places in often remote Arctic communities are attractive? Of course, we need to, you could say, have a certain minimum mass of people uh, and highly educated people uh, to have the, build a society around. Uh, I think you find that in several places in the, in the high north. Uh, can I just make a comment? I, I think uh, one thing that we've seen is that stability and an, uh, a long-term outlook is very important there. So there's got to be facilities. Um, it's got to be an attractive place to be, but the long-term outlook. And, and certainly in the past, industries moving into the Arctic and creating the idea that there's going to be a lot of development and then it suddenly moves away. Uh, people become skeptical, so there has to be a security that this isn't something that disappears in two years. Right. Yeah. I, I think, I, I, on our hand, we've not been all that successful. Uh, I think we, we are very much uh, uh, affected by the industry, so we started a, a big office in Tromsø that we had to cut back very severely uh, two years ago, and that, that's just the industry we are in, so it, it's uh, a bit forwards, backwards, hopefully in the long run we, we move ahead. Right. At this point I would like to provide the audience an opportunity to post questions. Uh, if you have questions, Bob pack them. Hi. Uh, Bob Packing from the Canadian International Arctic Center based here in Oslo. Two quick questions. Um, power generation, thinking about the Sami and one of your comments about uh, seeking social license in so many words. Uh, power lines and transmission lines, I always understood, had a, a very direct consequence on migratory routing for the, uh, the reindeer. I was curious how you go about doing that, something that in Canada and our Canadian Arctic context we're extremely aware of as a sensitivity, of course. Secondly, future proofing for climate change. Just curious about infrastructure needs and future proofing for absolutely guaranteed sea level rise, melting permafrost, would that might affect some of your installations, et cetera. Very curious on that point. Thank you. Let's take quick. Yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna let you add, uh, speak to the, to, to the grid side of this. Yeah. Uh, I, can, I can talk from a, uh, say, a, a, a wind power developer's perspective. And I think uh, you, you, you actually, you, our particular project, and I'm not going to take credit for this, is it was our partner started basically with looking at the registered reindeer herding patterns. And what you looked for was correl correlation between minimum impact on reindeer herding and high winds. And then you back out, uh, you, you try and look for other good conditions, so ease of access and all these things. Uh, so, so you start with that. Um, and then you start engaging in that dialogue because as part of that dialogue, again, you learn about unforeseen uh, or consequences or things about how uh, uh, how the process of reindeer herding itself is actually enacted. Then you adjust your plans on that basis. Then you also look for ways, okay, is there ways I can make your life easier? Is there something here that comes with the project that, that makes your day-to-day -day life easier? And I think it's, it's um, uh, I think we have now gotten to that phase where we're having very practical discussions about how do we tailor this project to um, where, where there are negative consequences, because there will always be some. Uh, we mitigate them the best way possible, and how do we look at what a project like this can deliver that makes your life easier long term. Um, and, and, and that can take a very sort of wide uh, a wide remit where you look at, for example, is there things that the project can do around competency building and all, all these things? Is there particular things, and, and for sure there are things you know about the area that we're looking at that you can tell us that de risks our rural project. So it's, I think, we start out with the assumption here that there's actually something in the region of value that we don't want to, that, that, that we want to maintain. Then we look at, okay, how do we find the balance? And then you try and create a process and a dialogue that, that optimizes that, for lack of a better word. Does that answer your question? Uh, I would like to add, uh, of course, constructing new lines, uh, that's, that's a conflict area. 
uh, but we need to seek dialogue uh, and find say, practical solutions and reach agreements uh, with the rain owners. Uh, we are restricting our operations during part of the year. Uh, we invest in a lot of uh, rain fences. Uh, that's part of the, you could say, the, the cost we need to take. Uh, but it's possible to, to reach agreements with them. Uh, it's not always that we reach uh, you could say agreement on the economic compensation, but that's another task. Thank you. Uh, so there is another question, three rows behind Bob. Uh, please keep it brief. I'm uh, Hannes Stahl from CTEC, which is a Finnish engineering company with presence here in uh, Norway. Uh, back again to this lack of uh, grid capacity. Uh, my question is to, to Hansen. Uh, have you at all considered hydrogen as an energy bearer to, for uh, transport and storage uh, to help have, that situation? Um, can we just take another question? I saw that there was also one uh, over there. We'll group these yeah. together as we need to start wrapping yeah. up things. Juha Lammusla, uh, Business Solo, regarding CO2 emissions. Uh, what is your biggest problem in the CO emissions and something what uh, Finnish industry and innovation system could be solved in the coming years? There is time for one final question if there is one at the audience. <laughs> That's... Um, hello, uh, Øyvind Isaksen from Norvea. I got a question to uh, Equinor. I have to learn that name. Why do you power your uh, operations with uh, gas when you're in the uh, area of best wind resources in Europe? Thank you. <laughs> All right. Panelists? Uh, I, I think the hydrogen bit yes. was... Uh, yes. uh, uh, you uh, pick the questions you want. Is, is, is yes. Uh, we, we are also looking at sort of a hydrogen in a broader context and its role within an energy system, the potential that it has there. I think we, we don't look at this particular project, we don't look at hydrogen as the solution to the grid. Uh, in, in that sense, it does make sense to us. Uh, because in our simplistic, maybe commercially driven way of thinking here, this is really about, uh, I mean, you can you can produce hydrogen, hydrogen even though you're on the grid, it's only economical if um, if that's better than alternative uses of that grid electricity. Uh, and in, in, in that context, the package here where you actually connect these wind resources to the grid is much, much better. And when in our view, you can make lots and lots and lots and lots of grid investment based purely on the cost of energy differential here, we think that should happen for that reason. Tertiary is obviously you're enabling industrial development in the Arctic, which right now there's no question. You can ask anyone, in, in particular in Eastern Finnmark, whether industrial development or development in general is hampered by things like electricity and security. Things that most of us in the room never even think about. They have to think very seriously about. And there was um, like to add a remark to that. Uh, you could easily get the impression that uh, uh, we got a low security of supply uh, and hampering uh, new consumers <laughs> into the area. Uh, we do not share that view. <laughs> uh, the security of supply is on the same level as the rest of the country, uh, at least on the central grid and the transmission side. Uh, it's some of the district uh, distribution system operators that have a lot of faults in their systems. That's another question. Uh, we not said no to any kind of consumptions uh, in the area. And we do have plans for how to meet, uh, you could say, uh, organic growth in the society. Of course, when it comes to larger uh, investment, like on the oil and gas side, we need to develop that in, in cooperation because that we need uh, a lot of new investments in the grid. Thank you. Yeah, um, well, we're very interested in hydrogen, but I'll, I'll leave the, <laughs> that discussion out here because I'm not qualified to talk about it in detail. Um, but we do, we do see hydrogen as an extremely interesting uh, source for the energy transition. Um, 
I think the, there was a question on what is the biggest challenge in terms of carbon footprint. Um, I'm not sure if it was directed towards Equinor, but um, I can certainly say something quickly on it, which is, um, okay, it's a big question, but if you wanted to pick the number one thing, uh, it would be reinjection of gas um, in, in offshore fields. And of course, if you backtrack that, then the reinjection of gas is because we don't have a solution for how to get that gas to a market and do something with it. So that would be our number one biggest challenge um, with uh, CO2 footprint. We've taken actions on a lot of the other issues. Um, and then there was a question on uh, why don't we power, power our fields with wind uh, instead of hydrocarbons? Um, well, it's uh, having electrification from shore. Um, that's one thing we work a lot with. Um, but we are looking at powering installations with wind as well, with concept projects. So, so you know, it's, it's a good idea and, and it's in progress. So. Oh, you're talking, sorry, we were talking about offshore, we were, okay, sorry, I thought you were talking about um, yeah. offshore wind, because we are looking at actually generating it offshore next to our platforms. Yeah, so, yeah, sorry. Time That's always it. runs really fast when you are in good company. That's the case today as well. Unfortunately, we're under strict time limits. I would like to ask you to join me for a round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> And I strongly encourage you to continue these discussions during the break. Thank you. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, panelists and Arno, and uh, we have now well-deserved uh, coffee break. Uh, I will ask you to come back to your seats at quarter past 11. Global warming to 1.5 degrees of Celsius equals 65 to 90% lower CO2 emissions in 2050 compared to the 2010 level. Such reductions can be achieved through combinations of new and existing technologies and practices. At the moment, these options are technically proven at various scales, but their large scale deployment may be limited. IPCC further states that international cooperation is critical and able for regions like the Arctic to reach the targets. The questions that we will discuss in this panel are, is the industry investing enough in innovative approaches to reduce their carbon footprint? And do we have the technology to develop the resources in the Arctic in a safe and sustainable way? We will hear from representatives from Kongsberg Group, Fortum, DNVGF, and Vartina. And without any further delay, it is my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Mr. Arne Rinnan. He is the Vice President, Technology at Kongsberg Group, and he also leads Kongsberg CTEC's R&D departments. Arne, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity of being here. Uh, Kongsberg, uh, not to be mixed with a small city in the southern part of Norway, is a, in, an industrial company in Norway based on uh, technology, very technology driven. We are also operating a quite complex uh, because we are involved in quite a lot of activities. Um, we heard earlier today that if it works in Finland, it works everywhere. So that means if it works in Finland, it works uh, subsea and it works in space. And Kongsberg is uh, active in all those uh, areas. So we are kind of used to be um, a part of hostile environments. And of course, Arctic is uh, in some respects a hostile environment as well. Uh, we are, but we are doing this with uh, the, as the same technology platform, basically. So uh, we are kind of used to uh, moving our solutions and the technology platform from one hostile environment to another one. Uh, Kongsberg is for the time being uh, organized uh, by this uh, structure. We have the maritime business, which is the biggest part of the company. 
Uh, we have the defense and security uh, business, which is the oldest one, actually. We drew it so back to 1814 at uh, Wolfsburg. Um, and uh, just to mention that, I think that might be relevant in this uh, context also, is that uh, uh, defense activity in Wolfsburg is not just about uh, traditional defense, but it's also about uh, cyber defense. Uh, and then we have uh, um, Kongsberg Digital. So we have uh, choose to, to move or, 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 or put a driver of a digital transformation into a separate uh, business unit. Uh, our global presence at the current is uh, more or less like this. We have about 7,000 employees and we are operating, I think it's in 24 countries. And it's not a part of the map, but actually we are also in Antarctica and we are at uh, Svalbard in the north. So we are basically covering the globe. Uh, on the technology side, um, as I said, we, we have a technology platform. That's the way <coughs> we are thinking and the way we are uh, focusing. Uh, and looking into the future and also into the future of being able to operate in the Arctic uh, we have identified three uh, emerging technologies that we are focusing on. Uh, so the first one is uh, autonomous solutions or enabling technology, technologies for autonomy. Because we are sometimes operating in environments where it's uh, difficult or dangerous uh, for people uh, to be. And then we need to have good solutions and good technology to be able to operate. Uh, maybe at the most extreme without people involved or at least not directly into the uh, to the operations so that's that's very important to us and we have been doing this for decades so it's not anything new but uh, we are kind of focusing even more at that aspect uh, the second one is uh, big data analytics uh, of course we as many other people uh, in the world see the true value of, uh, of data uh, and we think that uh, there is also knowledge uh, that can be mined out of data. So our approach to data analytics is that we are trying to combine uh, data analysis and our traditional uh, understanding of physics. We call that hybrid analytics, actually. So that's also a, a big effort uh, uh, in uh, the Coxsburg company. Uh, and the third one is uh, for short interaction. What we mean by that is uh, we think in the future we need to develop systems that is better of interacting with humans, even remotely or by virtual uh, operations. So we put a lot of effort in being able to develop solutions and systems to make that interaction better and smarter. Uh, because we, we have to stop the traditional way of engineering thinking that people have to adapt, adapt to the technology. We need to look uh, uh, turn it the other way around. So this is the three um, focus areas of, the, of de developing the approach technology into the future. Uh, but we have a lot of traditional technology as well, uh, and we have invested for decades uh, into several uh, technologies. So just very briefly, we are very deep into intelligent signal processing. Uh, we are also good at uh, developing mission-critical software, and you can see in the illustrations uh, those uh, technologies are relevant to Mosul. Uh, we are working a lot with complex uh, uh, system solutions, of course, reliable and extremely reliable electronics, uh, advanced control systems, and uh, the, the last one, cyber resilience, which is more important than we thought it would be just a few years ago. Uh, we are also using uh, our technology platform to look into a few new and um, innovation-driven approaches. So this uh, picture is uh, of Yara Birkeland, is probably most of you have heard about. It is an um, autonomous uh, uh, container carrier uh, that is going to transport the containers from uh, Porsgrunn to Breivik. Uh, 
Eventually, it will be totally unknown. It's fully electrically powered. Uh, and uh, it's, I think it represents, uh, it represents uh, a disruption, actually, in maritime transport, or maybe it's better to call it maritime logistics, because this is not just about this vessel, but it is about transforming the logistical uh, value chain. And uh, also, the, the competition here is not traditional maritime activity. Uh, we need to compete with uh, uh, land-based trucks, driving along roads and that's a it's a completely different uh, task uh, so uh, the last slide is uh, actually from uh, the communication hotspot uh, at the uh, Svalbard um, uh, we have been mentioning uh, connectivity and one of the uh, last or one of the remaining challenges in operating in arctic areas is of course communication because it's very hard uh, to establish uh, infrastructure uh, at very remote places. Uh, but still, we have in the modern, uh, modern world, we need to have connecting uh, solutions. So this is a radio station uh, based on completely new and innovative uh, technology. Uh, we have been working together with uh, the Norwegian authorities to establish a network of those stations at Svalbard to give connectivity to the coastal traffic uh, around as well. And that the picture kind of speaks for itself because it says something about what type of challenge, challenges are we actually meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Arne. Those were eight minutes well spent. For us Finns, Fortum is a major Finnish energy company. What many of us don't really know is that Fortum also has significant activities in Norway. Within electricity sales, for example, I read that there are 800,000 Norwegian electricity customers, which makes Fortum Norway's largest electricity supplier within waste management treatment and district heating, infrastructure for charging electric vehicles, and wind power production. Kato Sjöldstad is Head of Public Affairs in Fortum Norway. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much for being invited. Um, as you can see, in less than two hours, uh, the Earth uh, receives the amount of energy we consume annually. So. Do we need new energy solutions in the Arctic? The short answer is that we are doing solar in India and we are doing something else in the Nordics and the Arctic. Um, as you said, we have a wide range of uh, activities in Fortum and our vision is for a cleaner world. The business we do in Norway is related to consumer solutions, city solutions, and wind power. We have three installations in the uh, northern part of Norway. Uh, when it comes to city solutions, we have district heating, waste incineration. We have a very innovative CCS project. We are working with recycling and we do also work with smart city solutions. Um, the reason why we are so big in Norway related to uh, the consumer part is that we have this company called Fortum, which includes uh, charge and drive uh, solutions. We have Hofslundström. That's uh, strange because we have this uh, Hofslund transaction uh, one year ago, Norges Energi and Hallenkraft. Typical Norwegian names, not Finnish. Uh, but I can't uh, talk about everything, so I have choose uh, three topics and three business areas that we are handling with. First of all, carbon capture and storage. Um, we have a project here in Oslo, which we hope 
that in the future can go global, which includes the Arctic. We have wind uh, development and investments in the north and electromobility that I will also uh, be uh, talk about. First of all, uh, there is a global increase in waste amounts and it is a large CCS potential in Europe and it's a large recycling uh, potential. Waste, you can say it's a resource, but it's also a huge uh, problem. The Norwegian CCS project in total includes Norsjøen in uh, Brevik, it includes Fortum Oslo Varme, and the total construction of the uh, CCS project includes also Epinor, Total and Shell on the storage uh, part. Um, the CO2 uh, capture at uh, Klemmesrud, here in Oslo, is in the pre-studies at this moment. Next autumn, we will finish this pre-studies, which includes uh, a lot of testing. And through this testing, we have managed to capture 90% of the CO2 uh, gas based on fractions that we have taken out of the uh, waste incineration. And this is uh, quite positive and it's uh, a good position to be in when we are going further on. And our plan is to build a new plant in 2020 if the government and the parliament uh, do agree with us. Wind power is coming. I have stolen this slide from uh, Statnet. It says that in 2040, we will have as much as 60,000 megawatts with wind power uh, in the Nordics. Today, we have 15,600 megawatts. So this will be a huge increase if it happens. Today, in Norway, it's 3.8 terawatt that are under production and under building, it is 8.3 terawatt. This is in, in, in Norway. Uh, our projects is in both the Nordics and the Russia. And in Norway, we have Nygårdsfjell uh, in Narvik, Onstablåheia in uh, uh, at Sortland and Sørfjord, which is close to Narvik, in the municipality called uh, um, Tysfjord. And one of these are in production, one are under construction, and one of them are not started yet. But this will cover 170 uh, megawatt hours. So, we are growing, and here you can see in operation total in the north, we have 107 megawatts. Under construction, 147 megawatts. And under late development, 400 megawatts. So in a short time, we will be in a better uh, position related to the wind investments. In the Nordic uh, or in the northern part, close to uh, uh, Narvik and Sotland, we do cooperate with Nordkraft, which is a Norwegian uh, company. So we own uh, the wind parks and they operate the wind parks. Um, Fortum's wind outlook in Norway, we will say that uh, the grid situation has to be taken care of. We believe that uh, Stopnet and also FinGrid will take this seriously. And also when we see into their plans, we believe that this will be handled uh, in a professional way. Here you see the, the big players, Amazon, Google, Facebook, uh, Apple, 
they are in the Nordics. They are not in Norway, but they are in the Nordics. And maybe we can move them further on north in the future. Time will tell. And my last topic, where we are the largest uh, company in the Nordic change, uh, charge and drive market. This is somewhere in Norway, in the district. This is uh, the way you can charge your car and drive around. Uh, these days, we are working together with an American company it's called Momentum. And they have solutions for wireless uh, charging. So time will tell if it comes and when it comes. This is not the final chart, but we have looked at uh, Finnmark, and we believe that it's smart to get into the market, set up uh, charging uh, installments, so that we can de deliver uh, electricity to uh, electrical vehicles. We have looked at those uh, different places, but it's not the final chart. But we do have plans and we have to cooperate together with Enova to find the final uh, solution. So our slogan, join the change. Thank you very much, Thank you. There is an active discussion ongoing about deep sea minerals, at least in Central Europe. In the Nordics, we perhaps haven't gotten that far yet. But to tell, about, tell us about the prospects in deep sea mining from the Arctic perspective, we have with us today BNVGL's Chief Specialist in Environment, Mr. Jens Lagesen. We look forward to hearing from you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Very short about the media. Probably most of you know something already about the company. This is the world's largest uh, certification company for, for ships, ship classification. And uh, we are um, represented in more than 100 countries and we are about 13,000 people. We, of course, cover a lot of things related to, to the ocean oil and gas, uh, ship traffic, uh, wind, and of course, also fisheries. But today I'm going to talk about something different. Something maybe most of you haven't thought so much about, but in one way it's logical that we should also have minerals in, in the sea. I mean, we have land, we have ridges, mountains, and these, of course, many of them then continue into the sea. And, and this, is, this is a resource that uh, so far really hasn't been uh, looked upon a lot yet. Um, the, main, the main types are at very uh, deep water depths. You have, for example, the polymetallic nodules that are at four to 6,000 meters. And it tells itself it's, it's, very, it's very costly technology, of course, to do the mining. You have cobalt-rich crusts, which are between 800 and 2,400 meters. And you have the seafloor massive sulfides, which you can see are, for example, in form of active smokers. It's like an eruption coming out. And then when it comes into the cold water, it's stiffening. And then you get what you have on the upper right. Uh, it's also indicated metals here, uh, nickel, copper, cobalt, vanadium, copper, lead, zinc. It's, it's uh, quite a resource. So, potentially, this, this is a quite uh, large resource. Um, and what, what this is, could be good for is that we could in the future in, ensure a security of supply and we could fill a, a gap in the market where recycling is not possible or adequate. Or the, or the ter terrestrial mines, uh, the burden on them is, is too great. And one example you have here to the right, we discussed, for example, electrical vehicles. And, and uh, they, the, these are expected to skyrocket in the future. And that means also we need a lot of new metals for, for batteries, etc. Just one example. So, where are these deep sea minerals? Here is a map worldwide showing you what, what uh, we know so far. And you see there, there is... Um, uh, quite a large part of the of the sea in the earth where, where there is um, um, sea mineral, deep sea minerals, and it's also divided and in, into the uh, different types. Now let's go to the Arctic. Up in the Arctic, uh, we have have the northern part of the mid mid Atlantic ridge, 
where which contains both these active vent fields. We have sulfide deposits and hydrothermal plumes. And all these uh, co contain uh, different types of uh, minerals and metals. So this, this is a, a big resource we have, have up in the north. What we have to remember, though, is that this, this is uh, not an easy thing because there are a lot of environmental implications and environmental aspects. Of course, when you do mining, you will have a di direct destruction of, of seabed habitat. You will have a sediment disturbance and you will have these plumes when the machines are working on the seabed. You will have uh, also surface operation and be a vessel on the surface with, with a, a release of chemicals, waste, etc. if you don't take care of it. You will also have a thermal and the light pollution, and you will also have the risk of invasive species. Another thing is shown here to the to the bottom right. It shows that even though you uh, have, for example, here 20 years ago there was a machine going on the seabed, you come back 20 years later, it looks the same. The development is very slow here. Things are going on much, much slower on the seabed. What are we doing at the moment? This is um, some examples from Norway. As as the Mining it is not ongoing at this point. We are still doing research, etc., and finding out what, what, what a lot of things we need to know. This is a project called Marmine by NTNU. And the, the pictures here is from the field work done in 2016, and the project will be finished in 2020. And one of the important things here is, is to find out how, how can, can this be done and, and if it is feasible. I also want to mention there is, there is a lot of work done at the Jepson Center for Deep Sea Research at the University of Bergen. And, and they are working with the, the, the seafloor mapping. They are looking at these hydrothermal systems, which you see here to, to the right. And, and there is in general at this level here, it's, the main work is, is related to research and finding out more. Finally, where, where are we standing from, from a political point of view? There, we have to divide this into two parts. If you look into Norway, Norway is in its own uh, extended economical zone, uh, now releasing a law about um, and the deep sea mining. It's called the, 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 the law of uh, minerals on the seabed. And uh, it's probably, it will uh, go through in July next year. So it has been on hearing, and it is, is now a proposal for the storting. That is that part. Then is the international part. If you look into the international waters, which is uh, under the, the law of the seas, this is called uh, in a legal term the area, which is of course a, a, a humongous uh, amount of land. They are now in, uh, releasing also draft regulation on exploitation, and that is also out on the hearing. So those things go, go parallel, uh, and, and this will then lead to uh, the possibility in the future then that you can create uh, licenses like in oil and gas and have the license to do uh, deep sea mining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jens. Maritime activity in the Arctic is increasing. That's due to energy extraction and offshore activities, tourism, but also the opening up of new sea lanes. To update us on the technological solutions available for Arctic maritime industry, I am pleased to introduce Stein Tushagen of Vatsida. He has long international business experience, both from offshore and merchant industries, and he currently works as sales director in Vatsida. The floor is yours. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for the opportunity for Vatsla to speak uh, today. Uh, I'm talking about the technology solution for a smart Arctic, but first of all, um, at Vatsla, Finnish company, we are about 18,000 employees spread out around the world, so it's quite a big company. We are spread into two specific divisions, the energy solutions and the marine solutions. And within the uh, energy solutions is where we are supplying the uh, power gensets uh, for our gas engines. So whenever the farm in farms is uh, lacking or wind, our gas engine starts to provide electricity to the grid. For the other division, the marine solutions, we have uh, 
particularly this year, launched the uh, Smart Marine Ecosystem Strategy within the company, where we're actually looking into the uh, mitigating of the waste around the uh, uh, marine uh, market. We believe that there is a lot of waste which could be mitigated and to make it the shipping more smarter. We are looking into uh, the speed of the vessel, the, uh, the size of the vessel. We are looking into fuel uh, flexibility, uh, fuel alternative. We are talking about hyd uh, hydrogen. We are talking about fuel cells, etc. And we are looking also into the ports because we know all that you can see the picture here is outside uh, Shanghai, where all the vessels are laying, looking for their slots at the, at the, at the harbor. So all this uh, is part of our strategy. So we have also then launched what we called an, an oceanic awakening uh, to a kind of a wake up call to make sure that we are, cannot do this alone. This is all related to the decommunization decarbonization of the, the business. And we all know that we need to try to aim for the IMO's reduction of the CO2 up to 50% in 2050. So um, we are very serious in to try to find solutions uh, for uh, to do the merchants more efficient and more smarter than today. So then back to the Arctic, uh, we do definitely believe that there will be an increased Arctic uh, activity and particularly Arctic shipping. This is mainly based on the natural resources, which we have been discussing, the oil and gas exploration, mining onshore and offshore, as the previous uh, for DNV. But obviously, it is expensive and it's environmental sensitive. We have also the new uh, trade route that we are assuming that the Arctic route will be available part of the year. We have already had a number of G plants uh, in Russia area for the, the uh, Hamal plant. We have energy carriers working in these areas. What we, I will skip this to, uh, to, uh, to save time here, but what we believe as the challenges is definitely for the Arctic condition, there is low temperature, there is ice management, vulnerability environment, we have obviously concern of the emission to air and definitely discharge to waters. We have the safety aspects, working conditions, consequences of accidents, redundancies, maneuverability, and dynamic positioning. And hence, obviously, the cost of operation, transportation costs, risk, lack of repair facilities, and benefit with fuel flexibility. All this is criteria which, from us, from Bachelor's point of view, as a technology provider, that we definitely need to, uh, to, to f find a solution for. So our goal is definitely to have a safety of navigation, safety of environment, efficient port operation, reliability, remote of monitoring and conditioning-based maintenance, clean fuel, after-treatment, availability of spares, and proven technologies. All this goes into our design for the Arctic. And this, uh, back to the Yamal uh, LNG plant, you will see here the LNG, uh, LNG carrier specifically designed for this type of harsh environment. We have been talking about this uh, double acting vessel. You can see on, on, the, uh, on the upper picture here, that is actually the aft part of the vessel is acting as icebreaker. So this is a particular design criteria for, for LNG carry in this uh, environment. It's had to be strengthened the hull, obviously, for actually able to go into ice or 1.5 meter. It's hydrodynamic bow on, on the vessel and the LNG storage tank. There has been an innovative containment solution for this vessel. And the propulsion part of installing in these vessels is up to about 65 megawatt, which is twice or what you can see on a normal LNG carrier. And just to state here that Vestra is obviously part of, of, this, uh, of this delivery for, for the power installed in the vessel. We have been talking about the acid pot, which is the, pot, uh, the uh, propeller, which can turn 180 degrees to be able to be go in the, aft, uh, go the opposite direction. We have the engine room adapted to the cold, very high standard of safety, a winterized deck, for the crew on board and two wheelhouse because they need to go both ways. 
So this is our uh, technology provider into the Arctic. We are the most uh, largest uh, product and system provider uh, for, uh, for, for the vessels. So this is the, the various types of systems and equipment we are providing into uh, the vessel operating in the Arctic uh, area. This is uh, just a snapshot of the various vessels and you see from on the right hand side upper is the LNG fueled uh, icebreaker just uh, uh, delivered uh, in, in for, for Finland. And here again, uh, the aspects of navigation and the new routes. Uh, we believe definitely here we will see an, a large increase of uh, shipping activity. And it's then up to us as a provider for technology to make sure that we have an optimized route for these vessels. And this has to be in a safe, uh, safe condition by operating in this harsh env environment. We might also have ports which these vessels go into. And hence, uh, we also have the capability to provide a safe operation towards the ports where we are able to actually to simulate and build up the ports and simulate the approach to the port as well as the departure of the port and the operation at the port itself. So this is was just a snapshot of what the Vatsla is involved in and what we are prepared to and we also take the, the responsibility to make sure that we do our best for the decommunization. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stay. I would li like to invite all the rest of the speakers to join us in front. And just like last time, I also incur now encourage uh, the audience to prepare questions. We will open the floor quite early on. Uh, gentlemen, listening to you, uh, SMART is definitely a top, very relevant topic for today. It's also a concept which seems to be quite widely used in current uh, discussions. But what does it really mean? And is it applicable in the Arctic? Because I think it's really applicable in the Arctic because, uh, because of the environment, uh, the distances, and the difficulties we will have, we need to be uh, actually smarter. Because basically, the technology is kind of uh, uh, being uh, on a stepping stone, and, and we can do a lot of things, but we, it needs to be adapted to the practical environment and to the operational concept. And, uh, and uh, that's that's why we actually need even smarter, or maybe not smarter, but different uh, uh, end state solutions, so to speak. So I think it's very relevant to, to use that too. I think I can add also from um, which was part of my presentation from a safety point of view and for the uh, kind of the harsh environment. Definitely, the automation is something which we need to look into and. Uh, and also to, to make things smarter, to be able to reduce the, um, uh, the human being. It could be uh, uh, operations which can be operated more safer and more quicker uh, by doing it in an automated and more smarter way. I think uh, smarter is also to be innovative. We are now standing for the big challenge that we have, have to reduce our, our emissions. And that means that we have to do a lot within innovation and within technology to, to get to that point. Um, but when you talk about autonomous solutions and when you talk about operations in the Arctic, some of you were already touching upon the need for connectivity. We all know that there are currently major challenges related to connectivity in the Arctic. How do you assess the current situation? And what do you think would be the best way going forward in terms of improving that? Uh, I think uh, there is not one answer to that question, actually, because uh, we need to find a, a different solution. So, of course, we can, uh, we, because we cannot accept, uh, expect uh, fibers to be available mm -hmm. uh, in any place in Arctic. And I also think it, it is a cost issue because uh, transferring one byte of data will always be more expensive in the Arctic and uh, most other parts of the, of the world because of the lack of fiber communication. 
but there are there are several solutions, uh, but they might seem more complex because I think it will be a combination between like satellite broadband communication, some lambda-based infrastructure, but also uh, totally new concepts like also using. Uh, we have seen a lot of features of vessels actually uh, operating at sea, so why not use them as uh, communication hubs as well? Because we really need to do uh, what we can together with uh, new and uh, innovative uh, technology. Do we as societies invest enough in technology? Yeah, you, you're probably asking the wrong person. So you will always get the answer no, because we, we think that uh, this, this, is, this is the way that, that we, we can probably solve, solve the things in the future. That, then, of course, that there, there is, there is an, an enormous need always for, for these investments. So, so from, from my point of view, I, I see a big need for this. Of course, I also heard this morning there is a substantial amount invested, but it's, it's really also needed. I, I would say that uh, <clears throat> from our point of view, it's very important that uh, both uh, StartNet and uh, Finnegan are taking care of the grid situation and fulfill the needs of infrastructure in the future. I think it's important about investing in technology because we will do that if we see a business case. But the problem is the business case, and especially in areas uh, where you have a very, uh, very little people are living there and uh, there are long distances and so on. So, so it, it's, we need to look into how we can actually fund the work and the uh, Defend the necessary investment to think that's the key. Are we now talking about public private partnerships? For instance. Okay. Um, in terms of techno technological solutions and driving the development forward, what works best, incentives or stick? And I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of uh, referring, I would like you to start, Kato, especially referring to your CCS plans in Oslo. Mm. Well, uh, CCS, in fact, is. Uh, it's not a short topic. It's not a walk in the park. It's uh, it's it, but it's uh, it's in very important uh, uh, problem or it's very important to uh, solve because uh, you refer to this FN report, October the eighth, and uh, the CO two problem is huge. So uh, we hope that we can cooperate together with the Norwegian state and uh, that they also look at uh, the financial needs that uh, they have to fulfill together with uh, Fortune in this case. So, uh, so yes, we, uh, we have to be partners in, in, in this related to this topic. Jens, uh, in terms of subsea mining, are we already there uh, technologically? And how do you see the opportunities for technology transfer from other sectors? I, I would say what, I, what I've seen so far, it, it, we are not fully there yet. I, there's one project going on in Papua New Guinea with, okay, some financial problems, but they basically put mining gear from, from, from land on, on the seabed. And I think what we are looking into now in the future is, is uh, things that are developed more from from um, or what we use in, in, in deep waters in the oil and gas business ROV based other type of equipment so I I would like to see further uh, development there because it's very important I also pointed out that the that the risk of, of, of doing harm to the environment and to the seabed so I think we have we have to take another step from, from my point of view until we're there I would now like to open uh, the floor for questions. Again, please keep them free and state who you represent. And if there are none, we're... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. So thank you for the broad scope of presentations. Um, I'd like to touch on deep sea mining. So that's something we look at as well. And. Um, when it comes to deep sea mining, specifically in the Arctic, uh, a lot of the Arctic areas, especially the shelf areas, are shallow. And the, the particular substances that you put up were, were deeper water. So uh, if we were looking at mining in the Arctic, in the deeper water areas, would that not bring in a lot of 
other nations um, and their technologies and a lot of political issues as well. It, it, it does so far the, 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 the Norwegian politics or the foreign ministry has said that we were going to do it in, in the Norwegian zone and, and not go in, in, it in the international waters. So it, it will it will of course still even if it's done in the Norwegian zone there, there will be discussions etc about uh, the environmental impacts etc but as I said we, we are not there yet and, and there, there will be more development up, up till that point. There was another question here, all over the slides. Yes, thank you very much for those great presentations. Um, yesterday I was at a conference in Narvik uh, about smart cities um, and the smart cities in the Arctic. And we were discussing, is there uh, any particularities about being a smart city in the Arctic or is it just another smart city? Now, you are working on, on smart cities uh, in, in Fortum, in Kartu. Could you tell us a bit about uh, your perspective on that? Is there a, a special kind of smartness in the Arctic? Um, I'm not sure if there is a difference between the Arctic and the other cities, but um, smart city is, does not only limit it itself to electrifying, uh, etc. But uh, it's how the cities work inside and outside and together. So, uh, but using modern technology related to what I presented in electromobility and also use the flexibility between thermal energy and electricity, which is very important in cities. For example, uh, in, in uh, some cities you can use recovered heat uh, from data centers and put it into district heating, which we do in, in Oslo. But you can do this all over. You can also do it in, in the Nordics. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of solutions that you can put in. But this is a large topic, so uh, and a lot of elements, but just to give some examples. Hmm. Further questions from the audience? Uh, Stain, I uh, think you mentioned it in your presentation that uh, in terms of operating, we know that it's an environmentally sensitive areas, but this is a question to all of you. Uh, can we say for sure already that we have the technology that we need in place in order to do either shipping or seabed mining or others, other activities in a secure and sustainable manner? I think we have already proven from the shipping point of view, we have seen a number of tankers uh, doing uh, trading in or uh, transport in, in this area. We have the LNG carriers uh, now by the operating by the uh, international companies. Uh, obviously, the design of these vessels, as I pointed out, is, uh, is uh, quite a, a tough design, uh, which uh, hopefully will prevent that there are any uh, risk uh, by uh, operating in these areas. So definitely, uh, I believe that uh, the technology is there. Uh, and uh, I think we have to be prepared uh, if there is still something to do and to prepare ourselves better. Because I think uh, the, um, the trade uh, in the northern route might become uh, quicker and quicker, actually. Thank you. I should say something about the seabed. Maybe we, if you should look a little bit forward, we can, for example, look what's going on in the Pacific, where there already are international licenses at this point for exploration. And there, they already have areas that are no-go areas where, where you're not mining. And these, these are the areas of, of very high environmental value. And I, I can maybe see that some, something like that would, would also be what would be done in the Arctic. Uh, autonomous vessels, that's an extremely interesting future development. Well, it's basically already here. But can we expect in the future to that to provide a solution for, let's say, North and Sea route traffic? Um, I'm not so sure if, if uh, you have also have to look at the difference between autonomous and unmanned, because that is not the same. Right. Because we are talking more about autonomy as a concept also helping manned uh, operations from time to time. So 
Uh, but I think when, what we really need to look into is uh, the, the new concepts that, that uh, will be, become possible because we can operate in different ways, like with a communist technology. So uh, I think that's also the challenge. And then it's a challenge then to, in the Arctic specifically, is how do we actually develop concepts that we adapt to the Arctic challenges? Because it's not uh, necessarily true that we can just take a solution, uh, a concept from other parts of the world into the Arctic, because the Arctic has specific uh, uh, or challenges. Mm. Is the conversion easier the other way around if you do it in the Arctic? Sometimes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's, uh, it's all, uh, I think also it's uh, typical for Norwegian industry and maybe even European industry is that we are quite good at adapting to the operational context. That's where we are good and where we can compete with the rest of the world. So I think we also should use that competence and those skills uh, when it comes uh, to, the, to the Arctic operations. Kato, you mentioned that you were hoping that the CCS technology would go global. Do you agree with Arne, with Arne said? Um, yes, I, I don't see any conflict uh, between what you said and what I presented. So, uh, yes. But uh, I would say one thing <coughs> which is very important. Um, uh, we represent big companies, but in the first installations that we have done in the northern part of Norway, we have been cooperating with local companies, smaller companies. And when you set the SMB companies into business, you create uh, <coughs> values in the districts. And that's very important. So you have to cooperate with the local companies. And that's a, that's a very uh, important key factor to, to get success. This leads me back to the discussion that we already started in the first panel, uh, but which is, you could blame me, it's one of my hobby horses, the local content. Do you have any best practices to share as to how you engage with the locals and how you make sure that their capacity and knowledge meets your needs as big companies? Um, I can just say this in small terms, but uh, from the cooperation between Horten, which is a large company, and uh, and Nordkraft, uh, we have a good experience, uh, and they know the area much better than we do. So they are a local company, and we have in this cooperation also used uh, other uh, businesses in developing and installing uh, wind parks, and that has been very, very important. And then we have also, uh, the investment has been accepted because next year, and uh, I believe that the conflict, the level of the conflict related to, to wind will decrease. So um, if you have acceptance locally, it's much easier to go forward on. Um, we are at the Embassy of Finland today, and we have wonderful representation from companies from both of the countries, Finland and Norway. And one of the themes that I wanted to touch upon before we conclude, or as a concluding round, is your experiences from the potential of collaboration between the businesses in Finland and Norway, and whether you have encountered obstacles doing that. We can start with Arne. Yeah, I'm yeah. really aware of this. Um, uh, Kongsberg also is uh, almost 50% of the Finnish gas company in Kaltura. So we are quite used to cooperate with uh, our Finnish colleagues. Uh, and uh, um, during the first quarter of next year, we will also talk over the maritime business in uh, the service, which is one of our large activities in Finland. So I think it's, uh, that will be a good platform. For, for us, and uh, also looking into extending our business uh, into Finland uh, is also it's not just having a, a partner or a roadmap, and I think we will succeed with that. Uh, from Vestla's point of view, definitely uh, Vestla is an international company. They have acquired quite a number of different companies, also a number of companies from Norway. 
and uh, there has been uh, very good uh, working relations actually between the new companies acquired by Bachelor and uh, they see a, a huge uh, uh, added value uh, with uh, the company acquired from Norway. As you possibly know, uh, Norway is in the, in the lead in the environmental uh, part of, of, uh, of this uh, business and also from the LNG point of view. Um, we have uh, acquired quite a number of interesting uh, Norwegian companies, which plays a big role uh, for the development of actually as a company. Neat Media is, of course, uh, present also in Finland and, and as a shipping company, we, for example, have Wärtsele and others that we have excellent contact with. And from our point of view, I, I think the, this communication work works excellent. So I, I cannot see any cultural bridges or something like that. Right. Yes, we have a lot of joint activities. I mentioned Nordkraft, but also uh, here in Oslo, for instance, uh, Fortum Oslo Varme is owned uh, by the Oslo municipality, 50% and 50% by Fortum. And I could also give other examples, but uh, the fact is uh, we do a lot of joint activities uh, and we have a good experience doing that. Thank you, gentlemen. Please join me in a round of applause before I hand over the all over the right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna, for your for, for leading us through these two panels in a brilliant way. Thank you very much. Um, before we um, um, go to the conclude concluding remarks, I would just like to welcome you all to Arctic Frontiers 2019 Smart Arctic in Tromsø in uh, January the 21st to the 24th. So uh, I hope to see you all uh, there. On that note, it is a great pleasure to introduce Ambassador and Secretary General of Finland's Advisory Board on Arctic Affairs for the closing remarks, Harry Marki Renika. Thank you, Ole, and, and I thank Embassy Finland here in Oslo, Ambassador Antel, but also our very smart moderators, Anu and Ule, and, and speakers and panelists. Actually, it has been really interesting, good event. And even already in Finland, when we had these kind of uh, uh, smaller frontiers events, at the Norwegian Embassy, Oke Grutle was hosting those three times before this. So I can say that this continues the same way in the same way. And, and I really hope that we can do either in Finland or here another, especially because Finland, after sharing now the Arctic Council, which is over at the end uh, or in the end of May. So we will start 1st of July next year, the EU presidency, which will be lasting to the end, end of the year. So during that time, we might focus then perhaps more issues which are linked closely to EU and especially, I guess, to finance. But uh, today we have been hearing about developments in the Arctic activities and technological solutions. And I think that it has been fitting really well to our chairmanship team because it is exploring common solutions. There are a lot of Arctic events. Uh, where we have been hearing university people to finding solutions or politicians trying to find the solutions. Now today we have been listening uh, very much about business and technological solutions. And I have to say that uh, if I compare a bit these elements in finding solutions, so we all know that political decisions will take always a lot of time and they are slow. And same sometimes actually concerns scientific work because it is long-standing work and we can not really make, for example, policy recommendations if we don't really have real facts. And the facts matters now, especially when we are speaking about climate change, because it is the fact. And, uh, but today, and even in similar kind of events, uh, what is most encouraging here that we hear from companies that they have business solutions, they have solutions in technology. And so 
So uh, we have hope in my, I, I, I feel that we have hope, especially we heard this very shocking IPCC panel, uh, panel's report and how climate change is fast and rapidly changing our world. So we have these business solutions and it gives us hope and somehow when we realize that we have created these problems, we, we perhaps also, a man can so, solve these. Uh, and again, this fits quite well to our chairmanship program because we see that many things go hand in hand when we fight against climate change. Um, and sustainable development is an important element in our chairmanship program. And I think it will be in all solutions in the future. Uh, so uh, sustainability for companies certainly is an issue what you cannot and companies cannot ignore. And to make profit, to be successful in business, you have to be sustainable. And the more sustainable in your future companies are, they are doing better. And that is also in the Arctic Economic Council, very important element in, in, in the work what I've been hearing in several uh, events. And, uh, but I don't know whether we have been doing enough I attended one researcher uh, event in Finland a few days ago and uh, I found something lacking there and I think that there should be more to be done among businesses and between businesses and companies and researchers. And they don't have so much hope and they don't perhaps have so clear solutions as companies fortunately today. Um, Arctic is really changing and we also heard that Arctic is so different. There are different kinds of Arctic, but there are also elements in the Arctic which are global and local and regional. And, and there is also the word which combines everything. It can be global, combining local and global, but uh, that is another issue. <laughs> uh, and it was really nice to hear that big companies, they have to work more and they can work more with small and medium-sized companies in the high north and it's benefiting each and everybody. Uh, when we speak about these changes, so ice is melting, we have new maritime routes, corridors. Even in 20 years time, it's not only Northeast Passage, I have heard from ice researchers that in 20 years time, the vessels can navigate through the North Pole and it's quite incredible to think that there is really in practice a new ocean appearing what is happening first time in the human history because actually we haven't seen that kind of element in any of human uh, in, in any during any generation of human life so uh, the challenges are huge and they are ge changing the geopolitical situation geological situation everything and one element of course is this how much for example Europe and that concerns us very much how much Europe and Asia will be doing together. 55% uh, of the world's trade is covered by Asia and Europe already and world economy by Asia and Europe is covered by 60% and if we look at the tourism 70% of world's tourism is covered by Asia and Europe and everything is increasing. And traffic is increasing, trade is increasing. Can we think that Suez Channel really can accommodate all vessels there? In the also very fragile uh, geographical area in the Middle East. So this is an issue what we also will see uh, in all discussions, comparisons where everything is moving. And I guess that it is moving, traffic is moving much more rapidly to high north than what we expect. Uh, then about minerals, it was really interesting to hear about minerals. And, and in that event, what I attended a few days ago, there were a lot of comments that don't touch to our minerals and, and to our nature in the high north, what is so sensitive, because we have to protect the environment and so on. But when we fight against climate change, we have to remember moving to electricity cars, we really need the cobalt, 
in batteries. And the other alternative is, okay, let them do and extract it from Congo mines. 60% of cobalt is coming from Congo, and they are using child labor. And they don't respect any principles uh, of sustainability there. So I think that we can show the way also how to do everything in the most sustainable way. And when we speak about windmills, uh, build a windmill, 20 different minerals are needed in building a windmill. So these elements also show how much businesses belong to that fight against climate change. Uh, good news from Finland. Uh, our forests are growing much faster than expected and uh, predicted before. And our so-called carbon sink, this newly growing forest binding CO2 emissions, it's bigger than what we knew. New calculations show that it is much bigger. And, and uh, we have to remember also the, the forests when, when uh, we speak about Arctic and businesses in, in the Arctic because 70% of the European forests are in the Barents Euro Arctic area. And it is also a very strategic element uh, for Europe, especially but for the whole world. Uh, so, my favorite thing is to speak about Arctic Corridor and railway from Rovaniemi to Sirkenes. And actually, it links so much of these global and local things together. And uh, it it's certain kind of extension from the Northeast Passage. Uh, and also, when we think about uh, railways, railways are also the most environmentally friend friendly way. And we see that for the European Union is, is really putting a lot of money to the railways. In the next financial annual, uh, multi-annual uh, framework, they are increasing the budget for railways in billions, many billions. And just I wonder if, if there is no money coming from the European Union, for example, to this Arctic Railway in the future. There is already a proposal by the Commission that we, that European Union will be financing the extension to Tornia and from there to via Sweden to Narvi. But we are not considering that as this Arctic Railway, what we are speaking. And there will be a study released just before Christmas in Finland. It's done by Norwegians and Finns, and that will be creating a good basis for discussions, I hope, and, and prospects how we proceed for in this project. And, and we have so much common to do together, Finland and Norway, which affects the European Union, the whole world, that we can show and pave the way that we, everything what we do, we do in the most and best way, sustainability, respected there. And, and uh, I guess when we have the EU chairmanship presidency next year, that we can continue this discussion. And uh, I, I think that Norway, even not being a member, is shaping the European Union's Arctic policy very much. And, and let's do it together. Thank you very much. Thank you for your wise words, Hari. Um, the lunch is served at the room behind you. Please talk to each other, get to know each other. I would like to thank the speakers, moderators, and the audience. Enjoy your lunch.